Cause you're listening to Jams and T You won't see the show On your TV So we talk about things Musically Cause you're listening to Jams and T Listening to Jams and T Welcome everybody to a brand new episode of the Jams Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today we have a, a very, a, just a stacked fucking day for you guys. We are going to be talking about the second release of 2020 for electronic giants, Autecker. We are going to t- be talking about their new album and companion piece to their last album, which we have covered on this show. Go check that out if you haven't. We are going to be talking about Plus, the companion piece to Sign, and we are also going to be talking about the latest entry in the discography of underground hip-hop legend Aesop Rock, and on today's record club, we are talking about Sersha's recommended record, which is Dose Your Dreams by Fucked Up. So let's fucking get it. Yes. Yeah. And worth mentioning as well, a uh, special mm-hmm. ce- bit of celebration for us at this point. This is the 26th uh, main episode of the podcast, which means that we've done this every week. So it's se- officially six months this six week. Six months. So that's pretty cool, I think. Every yes, single same. week, too. Every, Every single, single week. One. We haven't missed a week. We've been there for you. Well, <laughs> just guilt our audience. <laughs> some of us have missed weeks. No, like, sure. Yeah, but well, that's, still. That's but I mean, like, we're five thing. people who live in different time zones during a, a pandemic. So I'm not really going to be too hard up about the fact that a couple of us have missed certain episodes. Yes. So let's kick into our first regular segment of what we've been listening to this week. Uh, I know that some of us, at least some of us, probably all of us, have um, some interesting records to talk about in this segment. So Jake, why don't you kick us off? All right. Uh, I had a... I mean, we we did have to uh, record this podcast one day after we normally do. So, I mean, I did technically have an extra day this week, but even if I didn't, I have had a fucking behemoth of shit that I've heard, especially new shit. Um, I guess first I'll talk about, um, I listened to, not the entire discography because I'm missing their most recent major record, but I listened to all of the EPs and the first two records from The World is a Beautiful Place and I Am No Longer Afraid to Die, uh, the uh, post-emo band. And... Um, yeah, I listened to Whenever, If Ever, and was like, oh my god. Like, I, I, instant Jake Cannon, I love that record. I've listened to it, like, maybe six, seven times this week. Uh, I, I adore it. It's, uh, like, even just calling, like, the label, like, post-emo, it doesn't even, like, do it justice. It's, like, it's emo, it's, um, there's, like, elements of electronic music, of post-rock, of just, like, alternative rock, just so much shit, and it's such a huge, dense sound that I'm not used to coming from this particular, like, sect of music. There's just so much to chew on, and all of the music is so fucking powerful and it's oh it's so it's so good it's so good um fucking the 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 last song on it uh getting sodas is just like yeah it's like a top 10 song of all time material like holy shit yeah um and all of their work is incredible so far i i love them i also did listen to harmlessness which is their other like major album and i do really really love that album just not it's not quite as much as whenever if ever um but they're both fucking incredible. I recommend them uh, highly. Uh, I also listened to a uh, very, very tyler week I've had. Uh, one of the big ones. I finally listened to a Ween album to sort of prepare for the fact that we're going to be talking about Ween on this show very soon. I listened to Quebec, uh, which is just one of the most fun albums I've ever heard. It is like, there's a lot of like darkness and sadness on it, but just like musically it is so vibrant and lush and bouncy and some of the songs are just actually super fun like the opener uh uh, or like mr fancy pants just like they've got a there's a spring in their step and like it's so fucking good and like the psychedelic parts of that album are just so unfathomably gorgeous and like i've seen it before and i'll say it again uh transdermal celebration 
is oh, one fuck. of the best songs ever. Like, Ooh, it's so good. Criteria. It just is unequivocally one of the best songs ever made. I like, and it's not even like I, I. It might make my top three on the record. Like I don't know. I've I've listened to it like twice so far. I'm nowhere near done with it. It was just like I didn't know if I was gonna be into Ween, and so just checking this out just like really invigorated me to be like, wow, I actually want to listen to their stuff because this is like, I wouldn't necessarily call it like for me. It's just something that I really enjoy. There's just ah, oh, uh, tried and true. What a good fucking song. Uh, Chocolate Town, amazing fucking song. I don't want uh, and it. The opener. I don't want it fucking devastating, but like the opener is just oh, one of the most fun, like punk songs I've ever fucking heard. It's so, ah, I love it. Yes. Goes and it goes and it goes. Um, I will give a shout out to, um, I'll give a shout out to Zach uh, because he's been recommending this album forever. I listened to the new uh, Oransi Pazuzu uh, album. Um, Pazuzu? Yes, that one. Uh, it's called Mesterin Kinsey. Uh, I don't know what language this in, or or is it even a language? Who fucking knows? Uh, but it's a psychedelic black metal album, and it's fucking awesome. It's so good. Like, there's parts of it where I'm just like. There, there's like parts I think on the second track that really reminded me of like golden era Opeth. Uh, there are parts that are like super just fucking like atmospheric and sight. Like it, there's like a moment on that album where I was just like, this fucking makes me think of um, uh, uh, the, the first Verve album. This is fucking blowing my mind. It's just, it's so good. Uh, it's, it's real fucking good. Sorry, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, someone named Sir John Nipples just retweeted <laughs> that cat vibing to Aesop Rock. Yeah, he's, he's, he's one of my longtime mutuals on both my. <laughs> well, <laughs> shout out then to Mister <laughs> Nipples. <laughs> Mister hey, Nipples, he's a great dude. He's awesome. You should follow him. Oh <laughs> man, the, 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 I will. The, I shall now read. I shall now read his bio, which says I should probably note that I'm not a registered sex offender. <laughs> a purely public facing nipples, i.e. no DMs. Would a registered How? sex offender insist on no DMs? Great, great dude. He's awesome. God damn, you know, I bet um, <laughs> Sir John Nipples, the, um, the sword I, the stone story would be very different. I, I, would, I would trust him with my life. His his at is benign syphilis. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Christ. why is this why, benign syphilis? What is this a fucking ween song? This isn't a real person. Uh, well, I'm I'm glad he he retweeted that video because it's very good. It very um, good. I you oh, were saying Jake <laughs> uh, for the first time I listened to a solo project by Omar Rodriguez Lopez of the Mars Volta. Um, just because the man has like 300 really 40 albums and releases like two a year and so it's just like where do I even fucking start with this one I'm just like uh, I'm gonna find the one that's easiest to find on streaming and has the highest rating uh, and so I found the album <clears throat> Ensayo de un desparaciero um, bless you yeah exactly uh, Spanish right. Sosha um, <laughs> racist <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but um, it's good. Um, I think the first two tracks on that album are a bit too like minimal and, and sparse for their own good, just because, like, you know, if you go to Omar Rodriguez Lopez, you're expecting at least some kind of shade of the Mars Volta in some aspect. And um, it's, it's that adjacent, except I'd recommend it to like people who like Stephen Wilson's solo stuff as well. Um, it's not like a heavy substantive project it's a it's a good album it is not a great album but i would highly recommend it if you're just you know into prog music and you like that sort of world of uh the mars volta sound um but hardly essential uh and the last thing i will talk about despite the fact that i've just i've been really catching up on a bunch of shit um other than i i, I will briefly say um Tyler uh, recommended I listen to uh, Near My God by Foxing, my first Foxing album, yes. which uh, it's amazing. Go listen to it. I, yes. I don't 
know what to say about it, which is why I'm skipping over it briefly, just because there's a lot to unpack there, but I know that I loved it. Yes. Um, it's great. Uh, but uh, the last thing I will talk about is an album that came out of literally fucking nowhere. I have no idea how I even found this, but it is an album called, it's self-titled uh, Probot. And I was like, the fuck is this? Apparently, there's a side project of one mister, Dave Grohl. He drums oh, on yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I've heard of this. And Probot is a weird album because... It's a metal record, but every mm. single song is fronted by the member of a different metal band. To the point oh, where yes. when it switched to the second song, um, I was just like, oh, so this is what the singer sounds like. Oh, okay, I can get into this. And then suddenly I was like, this man is either breaking out the most uncanny let me kill Meister impression I have ever heard in my life. <laughs> or that is actually the fucking front man of Motorhead. And lo and fucking behold, it actually was. Um, and it's a lot of fun. Like, I struggle to call it, like, incredible or anything. But, like, it's just, it's so much fun. There's so many different styles. There's people, like, like fucking Mike Deernt is on it. Um, Jack Black does the closing track. It's fucking amazing. He sings a song called The Warlock. Um, and, and I believe the first opening line is, I am the warlock and I'm going to fuck your life up. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's really fun. Highly recommend it. Uh, and also the drumming's outstanding, but you know. <laughs> Dave. That's going on my you know, to listen list. Very fun. Very different, like, eclectic, like, styles of metal. Like, they do, like, the motor, like, you know, the one with Lemmy is, like, very clearly a Motorhead homage. But there's also, like, you know, it's also, like, death metal. Some of it's, like, speed metal. And it's just, oh, it's fun. <laughs> one of these songs is sung by the frontman of fucking Voivod, if any of you Yes, know it is. And it's great. It's fucking <laughs> awesome. awesome. I have to hear this. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know why I'd never heard about this before, but I was just like, okay. This is cool. Sick. That should give you a good idea of the amount of shit I've been listening to this week. But, I mean, like, I could have <laughs> throw in, like, half of that with being listens of fucking Plus and the Aesop Rock discography. Yeah. The Plus discography. Me too. Dave, uh, Dave spoke at Lemmy's funeral. Oh, wow. There's a, there's oh. a video of it. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it, it runs the emotional gamut. Yeah, <laughs> Laugh, I mean, cry. Yeah, safe to assume that it yep. would, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, those are all really interesting albums. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> well done, Jake. You passed the test. Morgan, <laughs> what have you been listening to? Uh, significantly less interesting albums. Um, once again, only two. Shut up. <laughs> I, I, longer I to laugh the after that than I was anticipating <laughs> it was supposed to be funny immediately and then you waited to laugh and I felt like a dickhead <laughs> <sighs> the same energy as Tyler's like the song <laughs> okay so I uh, well one, one of these is actually very interesting because I, I was I was largely unfamiliar with, well, completely unfamiliar before this week with uh, Aesop Rock. So I had been hearing great things about The Impossible Kid for years now and finally sat down and checked that out and haven't gone too in depth with it just because I've had to go pretty in depth with the one that we're covering today. But the, uh, the shit just knocks. It's uh, it's. I mean, it's it's, it's phenomenal. It's, it's amazing. I, I'm very glad because I've been championing that for like a, like right. two years now, and I'm the only person who's heard it. And I am very very glad that that has stopped being the case. I'm pretty sure. Never mind. Um. Uh, the only other interest, well, significant thing that I listened to that we're not covering today is uh the sophomore album by third eye blind which oh. is uh, uh it, it's definitely an album um it's really really interesting behind the scenes stuff happening in the uh 
in the lead up and aftermath of this album, most notably the firing of uh, lead guitarist and secondary songwriter Kevin Cadigan, I think is how you say his name, uh, like a day before they uh, played the lead single on Jay Leno. Oh no! Uh, and that uh, that. The the song they played is a great song. It's uh, one of their bigger ones called Never Let You Go. Um, I like it a lot. The uh, performance is terrible. I mean, just phenomenal in the ways that this is like, <laughs> they've, they're a man down and it's affected everything. <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's, Live performances on talk shows are my favorite thing because they are either like noticeably worse than whatever is on the studio equivalent or they're the Mars Volta where everyone in the audience mm. is like, what in the absolute mother of God is happening? Yeah. One of my favorite like, TV yeah. show performances is, um, I hate to be painfully me, um, but when the Mountain Goats and Stephen Colbert, they did this year and Stephen Colbert joined in because he just loves that song so much and it's the most adorable thing you've ever seen in your whole life i've Stephen seen Colbert it would. i have seen your, it yeah your abil- yeah. your ability to bring everything back to the mountain goats is <laughs> astounding sometimes like to even <laughs> consider the notion that i could do something similar with like Stephen wilson or devin townsend is is a is laughable honestly yeah. i cannot compare mm-hmm. to you Thank you. Yeah, the album I, is yeah. ranges from painfully mediocre to sometimes very good. So it's 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 more of a frustrating listen than anything. And frankly, I wouldn't recommend s- spending valuable time with it. Mm. Eh, and everything else I listened to this week, we're covering because we're up to like a three and a half hour total of music yep. this week. Yes. So we are. Good to shit. be thick. I, uh, Sersha, you're up. Hello. Um, so where do I begin? Um, I have also listened to Whenever If Ever, um, because just I'd been meaning to listen to it already for about a year. I saw that Jake really loved it, so I was like, well, fuck it, time to get around to it. Um, I didn't love it quite as much as Jake, but I liked it a whole bunch. Um, I listened to the new Bruce Springsteen record, Letter to You. Um, which I probably also didn't like as much as everyone else, but that's to be expected. Did like it a lot, which is pretty good. Um, yeah, so I think I felt like a few of the songs just kind of outstayed their welcome, and it's riddled with the things about Springsteen sound I just don't gravitate to. Um, but there are a few really Shock. exceptional. Yeah, but it... Bruce Springsteen has tendencies that I don't like on this Bruce Springsteen album. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to explain my thoughts, Morgan. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, but there are a few songs in there that are just, whether you like his sound or not, are just exceptional songs. Um, and yeah, it's just really, really good. I've already talked about two records. That's crazy. Um, listen to Hospice, which I loved so much yeah, I, I yeah. listened to that for the first time uh, a month ago mm. yeah by god what an album app- that is just mm-hmm. absolutely fell in love with it yeah. real hard um i haven't been able to listen to it since because i've been listening to pod al- albums of the podcast but um, i'm going to listen to it a lot when i get the time. i didn't think i'd be able to get back to it just because i found it so like emotionally potent but i managed to work up the the gall to do it again surprisingly yeah like that's well, the for, thing for that's me the thing. it's Don't... it's an emotionally wrenching album but the music is so peaceful you know um it helps cool so i interrupted tyler I no i was just gonna say like i wouldn't blame you for not being able to revisit it because it's to me like it takes a lot out of me every time i listen to it it just Mm -hmm. yeah quite heavy subject matter obviously that was was some tasty radio silence we had just there (laughs) and i would have i would have broken it if i knew how to because i haven't heard this this album we speak of yeah i'll tell you what definitely um don't i 
don't I don't need to say this because I've fucking said it a million times before and I'm annoyed like that. But definitely don't sleep on their other records because a lot of mm-hmm. people do. Mm-hmm. A lot of people are like, oh, the Antlers, they're the hospice band. And it's like, yes, but they also have these other albums that I think mm-hmm. are better or yeah. as good. I've had um, familiars on my to listen list longer because of your recommendation. Yeah, and then yeah, like, I, I think I think you might like burst apart more. It's kind of like it takes the sort of topicality of hospice, although it's not quite as heavy, but it kind of transfuses it into these very kind of like beautiful, um, sort of slow kind of pop songs. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really sweet stuff. Okay, I shall give that a listen. Thank you. Um, I also listened to Live the Dream by Ramshackle Glory. Um, a very, well, it's sort of interesting because um, I talk about Pat the Bunny a lot. Um, obviously, like, not obviously, but obviously to people who know about him sort of really broke out on the scene with his band um, Wingnut Dishwasher Union. Um, and Ramshackle Glory is kind Why of... Why are these people so bad at naming things? I know. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, Ramshackle Glory is kind of the in-between space in his career before he did solo stuff. Um, and it has um, a song on it I've loved for a really, really, really long time called um, Your Heart's a Muscle, The Size of Your Fist. Um, it's Love Gang of the- Youths. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, see, I was I was resisting it. I was like, <laughs> you just oh, fuck. I didn't do it because it would be a good joke. I did it because Sersha was talking and couldn't make the joke herself. Sure, sure. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I actually think that if you're curious about folk punk, this is a wonderful place to start. If you're curious. Um, it's just really fun, um, emotionally potent, just really anarchic and fun. Like uh, one of the first songs open has the hook of um, I wanted to kill my landlord, but he was pretty nice. Um, and it's just a really cute record. That's, that's um, actually, that makes me think of Whenever If Ever, the one song that begins with, do you think the landlord's pissed? Yeah, yeah. I actually think if you like Whenever If Ever or uh, the band in general, there are things on this record that has crossover appeal. Um, Losing my edge to to younger and smarter and more attractive people. They're actually they're actually really really nice. Yeah. <laughs> but no. Um, I mean, look, I push for this kind of music to be heard anyway. But this record especially, uh, "Live the Dream" by Ramshackle Glory. Uh, and the final record I want to talk about is. The another record on the list of why the fuck haven't I heard this before being um, Mad Villainy. Oh, uh, right. Great record. Yeah, which I, I enjoyed very much. Um, the production is outstanding. The writing's really good. The performances are great. Um, tripping on I'm the gonna... beat, kind of. <laughs> tripping on the beat. <laughs> You're doing disaster. great, honey. <laughs> Listen, listening to a white boy try to rap a Daniel Dumoulin verse is the funniest fucking thing. <laughs> dripping off the beat, kinda. Dripping off the meat grinder. What? Charming. Why did you sound like slow uh, tie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm going to make um, food a priority now. And vaude, va- vaudeville villain, secretly his mm. best. Yes. We'll, we'll check that out. That's me. That's my week. Uh, I listen to other albums, but they're less interesting to talk about, so I'm going to shut up now. I have some great records to shout out in this segment. Uh, like Jake, I had a fucking stellar week. I gave two uh, new first listen 10 out of 10s, which I seldom do, but um, have probably done like 50 times this year <laughs> so so never mind um this is also i have to say like um i i'm looking through the list that i keep of all my first listens this is probably the year that i this will by the end of this year this will have been the year in which i've heard the most music of any year of my life i think oh me by a long strut right here so that's like awesome um but anyway the first one i want to shout out um death human 
I agree. Wow. Wow. Holy shit. Somehow the hype still doesn't do it justice. Like, I held off on giving leprosy a 10 out of 10 because I was thoroughly assured that there was a ceiling yet to come. Um, yep. and, you're, uh, and you're telling me it's like possibly gets even better? Yeah. Man, you, not you, even, uh, you've less hit the possible, ce- more probable. It's the ceiling here is the, not the ceiling to a room, Tyler, but a mansion. Yeah, and I mean, this, and this is the gotta, chandelier because mm-hmm. it is an absolutely beautiful piece of their career, like coming mm-hmm. at the point where it does um, after spiritual healing, which I liked, but I think is generally agreed to be not quite as focused as their other mm-hmm. records. Um, just thir- this is this is thirty three minutes and change, and it does not waste a second there is this shit on this record that i literally double taked when i heard it for the first time there are moments on this record cosmic sea being the big one where i was like whoa okay this is yeah and it's always nice to see a band because it was clear to me from leprosy that these guys were the absolute best at what they do and basically what they were doing with their record is they were making a fucking genre blueprint basically so mm-hmm. it's, it's awesome to see that genre blueprint be laid and then to see the same guys that do that challenging it and like daring to yep. do some shit that you know you would not expect um and 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 you know it's really really it was really just such a, a draining experience in the best way possible um i i cannot recommend it enough uh, it may be my favorite but that's not to say like any of the last four death albums are like like i, I genuinely think you'll probably join morgan in the sound of perseverance camp um that's my second favorite because that album is like i, I listen to that and i just I, I don't know how music can get more... Per- like, I would say that Sound of Perseverance is the inner silent way of death metal. Wow. And that's like the last album, too. So that's like, mm-hmm. what, a, what a note to go out on. I can't it's wait. an incredible one. And I their am, cover of Painkiller. Oh, my God. I am 100% going to listen to individual thought patterns in the next week. I'm going to probably do, like, one of these per week and just and the, knock the it out The bass that on that album is going to rock your fucking world. I can't wait. I yeah, yeah, I need to. I already just want to listen to Human again right now. I'll do it I've later. done that a lot. Um, I just like, because when you find these classic records, right, it's especially mm-hmm. satisfying when it's like one that you can just put on at any time. Like 33 minutes is just so concise. Mm-hmm. And like, I feel like I could just play it any time and it would be perfect. for. And it wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, okay, I love this album, but like, yeah, do we have the time to listen to it now? No, yep. I can put human on whenever. Um, anyway, it's going to be really fun to discuss that in a couple months' time. Yes, we are going to be doing for our viewers at home. We are going to be doing a video on the discography of death, so look out mm-hmm. for that. Um, so second, a great episode. Second record. Actually, I'll come back to the second record. I'll do it full circle. I'll do my other t- first listen ten at, at the end of this segment, um, mm-hmm. and I'll skip to another record I want to shout out: um, Ghosts Meliora. Another sort of metal record in the canon of Jake and I believe Morgan as well. Um, Yeah. Very, very, very fun album. Like I see, was saying to Jake when I was listening to it, I wish that I had like listened to it this like Halloween time because it just has that kind of, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's irreverent, but it has a kind of sense of fun and playfulness to it that I really enjoy. Theatricality. Theatricality. Exactly. That's it. It's, it's that it's very theatrical, but it's also like, crushes and it has like great songwriting great I, construction um, cerise came on in my car yesterday and i was just like this is the best heavy metal song of all time oh my yeah, God. It's, a very, <laughs> it's a very great song and i thoroughly enjoyed listening to i'm very song. glad very glad uh, as i knew i would and also again another record that is just like tight as a mofo just, mm-hmm. just flies oh God. By. um mm-hmm. Okay, and another record I will shout out. Oh, already been shouted out by Jake, but I also listened to Aranzi Pazuzu. Uh, Pazuzu, in Morgan's words. Um, or you uh, could do yeah, it like a so fucking Linda Blair. Pazuzu. <laughs> exactly. I believe that is probably how it's intended to be said. 
Uh, and <laughs> yes, the album Mister and Kinsey, uh, just some earth rattling shit. Mm. Um, yeah, it's very, very. It's just like was not what I was expecting at all. It's a lot more kind of weirdly proggy and atmospheric and, and electronic in certain points and filthy, just absolutely disgusting. Yes. Um, thoroughly enjoyed it. There were moments, okay. There was m- moments that reminded me probably just because I've been listening to him a lot. There were some moments that reminded me a little bit of Opeth and the way songs were constructed and mm-hmm. the closer heavily reminded me of the glowing man era swans as well. So it's yep. those kinds of references combined with electronics and weird, um, soundscapes appeals to you, then this record is essential listening. Um, definitely, definitely going to be um, high up on my final year end ranking. Um, I also want to shout out, I listened to Chelsea Wolfe's Abyss, um, which uh, I've been doing Chelsea Wolfe's records in order. Uh, I did Apocalypsis, I did Unknown Rooms, I did Pain is Beauty. Uh, I enjoyed those three all very much. They all, they each had incredible highlights. Um, I did feel they were a little bit, um, those highlights maybe dwarfed some of the other tracks on the record a little bit to a certain extent with those albums, although they were all quite good. Uh, Abyss, however, is handily the best one I've heard so far. It's the most well-constructed. It's the most consistently excellent so far that I've heard. Uh, Really just a bunch of really really great tracks on it um carry and flowers man what a fucking song yes carry and flowers um let me bring it up what else did i love on that album uh iron moon the whole first run oh. the whole first six tracks i think is just insane gray days and after the fall incredible oh, yeah. um i also really dug survive and the closing mm. track as well um just yeah there wasn't really a miss on there i don't think um just thoroughly enveloping record like Chelsea's always been incredibly talented at, at sort of conjuring these sort of heavy and eerie soundscapes. But um, here's where I feel as though it's consistently cohering into great songs throughout the whole record. Um, and that's very, very gratifying. As I've been wanting to love a Chelsea Wolf album ever since I found out that how much of a fan you were, Jake. So it's very nice to finally to be able to say, yes, here's one I love. And I will be listening to his fun very soon as well. His one's the other one I think you'll really dig. It's just fucking like awesome gothic doom metal. Yeah, Can't go yeah. wrong. It's like, I, I remember I downloaded it onto my phone when it came out and I just never listened to it. So that's on me. I will do, rectify that very soon. Um, so how many of I, one, two, three, uh, four. So, okay. My last record I'm going to shout out. Um, now this is the big record. Um, this is Probably, I would have to go back through this gigantic hundreds long list to check, but I think this is the best album I've heard this year. Um, overtaking Naked City? Yep, well, definitely overtaking Naked City, uh, uh-huh. overtaking McCluskey Do Dallas, overtaking um, Still Life, overtaking Quebec, overtaking. What's your pleasure overtaking? I can say what the album is. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. You're right. I'll say what the album is. So the album is uh, Sing to God by the Cardiacs. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. And yes, yeah, so it's a 90 minute opus of um, what genre are we doing? Yes, not, not really. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not really that it's varied in genre. It's just that it's a consistently shifting album. It's basically, it's prog, basically. Um, and, but it's really, really fucking weird prog. And, and it's like a manic album. And a, it, it never, it's never content to stay in, stay in the same place. Like, any given 30 seconds of this album is different to any other given 30 seconds of this album. It's 90 minutes long, but it does not feel it at all. It is constantly moving. And it's like, it's one of those records as well, where it's like, we're going from greatest prog song of the post 70s era contender to greatest prog song of the post 70s era contender to greatest pro. We're doing this over and over and over and over again. And it's, it's, it was already like a 10 in my mind before I even got halfway through it. And then you get like these, a bunch of like nine minute songs in the second half that are like somehow better. 
and it's like what the fuck this is this is not even like a whole lifetime's worth of inspiration put into one album it is a whole genre's worth of highlights I, I cannot be hyperbolic enough about this record. I'm going to make sure we discuss it on Record Club at some point in the next few months. So we'll be able to talk about it in more depth. But really, like, this is an album you could write a book on. Um, and it's just never work either. Like, it is an exhausting record. It's a record that does a lot of shit. It's like, whoa, okay, we're doing stuff. But it isn't, doesn't feel, like, wearying. It always feels gratifying and fun. And it's not doesn't take itself too seriously either. It's a really rich sense of humor. Like it's a it's a record made by a bunch of dudes who are up to no good. <laughs> it was not meant to evoke the Prince of Bel Air, but never mind. Um, a great album, the best album I've heard this year, and that's my segment. Nice. Yeah, I tried to listen to that album a couple weeks ago, and uh, I had to stop three tracks in just because I was like, all right. That was a lot. I need to do this in the right headspace because God bless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you definitely need to be in the right frame of mind to approach it for the first time. Yep. But I think once you hit, once you kind of know it, you'll just be like, this is so much fun. Yeah. It's like what I said when I was listening to it the first time is that uh, I said a lot of shit. Um, but one thing I said was it was like the experience of listening to Francis the Mute by the Mars Volta for the yeah. first time when I was 14 or 15. Or however old I was when I heard that, um, it has it evoked the same experience as listening to that for me of total being totally overwhelmed, hearing shit I'd never heard before in music, and also just being like I know unequivocally that this rules in my bones, and it's the same thing with, with Sing to God. Cool. And yeah, uh, that nice. is good me. work, team. Good work. Now. And now no. we get into no. what sock. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a wet uh, sock. Sorry, what? Um, what? Aesop rock. Aesop rock. Yep, that's it. Aesop sailed. Fun fact: Aesop Rocky actually apologized to Aesop Rock because he found out he retroactively kind of stole his name. That's, that's, that's very nice that he apologized. Um, yes. Yeah, Isn't that cute? Now, where are the royalties at? <laughs> um I say, rocky you're nothing um shit no he's it's good he, he's good God. but like clams casino gave him his whole career so it's whatever rip um anyway <laughs> uh jake right you yeah. this artist All right. on record uh aesop rock uh <laughs> real name just fucking absolutely kills me just because it's like his, his just his name's ian what a yeah. normal fucking name. Cool. Oh, Ian. Good idea. Fucking Ian, Ian Bavitz. Uh, Ian Bavitz. Uh, underground hip hop sensation. Aesop Rock has sort of been knocking around since the late 90s. Um, has done a lot of producer work. He is very good friends uh, with LP of Run the Jewels. Has done a lot of work over the years, producer credits with him. Uh, started uh, in 1997 and has basically. Like, I've been going through his discography just to prepare for this because I was uh, a fan and I was, I believe, the one who might have suggested this into the, uh, the uh, pod. But um, I was just like, I haven't heard all of his records yet. I need to do that because I've only heard like the last four and I'm pretty sure he's got a couple more. So I listened to all of them. And um, what you need to know about Aesop Rock's career is that, like, miss one time, my man. Once. He doesn't. He just... Mm doesn't. Um, his first few records are good. They got a lot of attention uh, everywhere. He was sort of self-produced at the time, um, but he did sort of hit a major critical stride with his 2001 record, Labor Days, um, which just has um, lots of good uh, features, some interesting producer credits, but just sort of uh, is one of his most beloved projects, a sort of... Um, uh, the, the production's very... I describe it as being like very early 90s in a lot of ways. There's, I feel like, a lot of inspiration to what would become art rap later in the following decade. 
uh, and he's sort of a pioneer in a lot of ways. And then he dropped his most recent album before this, The Impossible Kid, in 2016 to universal acclaim. Pretty much everybody loved that album. It was a notable turn for him as it was a more autobiographical and personal record where he divulged a bunch of stuff about him and his past and his dealings with anxiety, isolation, depression. He also took a bit of a right turn with sound uh, because all of the beats on that album were heavily electronic, heavily processed. And um, since then, he's done an EP and a collaborative project with producer Tobacco called Malibu Ken, which was pretty good. Um, but this is his first record since then, Spirit World Field Guide, um, which is entirely produced by him. I believe there's only one other producer credit on this album. Um, and following in the stead of all of his projects, it is an album with a shitload of songs. It runs slightly north of one hour. And yeah, that's the record. It's weird when you have to follow up an album like Impossible Kid, just because, you know, it wasn't like Good Kid, Mad City or anything. But, you know, everybody really liked it and it was a notable shift for him. So, you know, that begs the question, what do you even do next? Um, it's just amazing that, like, He's not as popular of an MC as either person from Run the Jewels or, you know, your Kendrick Lamars, your Freddie Gibbs, your Eminem's, or pretty much half the entire modern hip hop game. He's a real hip hop heads artist. Um, uh, he's been cranking out like a shockingly great output of records as I just talked about for more than 20 years and he's always delivered. Um, Aesop's known for having these really dynamic absolutely untouchable flows with like immaculate technical ability, coupling with verbose, heady, but irreverent bars that make him most comparable to somebody like Daniel Dumoulin. Uh, so dense, in fact, that he's got categorically the largest vocabulary in the genre of hip hop, for whatever that's worth. Um, it is a bit of a barrier for his, uh, in terms of like getting into him though, I will admit, uh, as sometimes this is a double-edged sword that allows the subject matter and references and double meanings to sort of go over your head a bit, seeing as he's always operating at top speed. And by top speed, I don't mean that he's like a lyrical miracle, I can rap fast Eminem rapper. I mean that his flows are so insane that you need to like check yourself to be sure you just actually heard what you did. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, his records are all dense, uh, but for me, they've always proved rewarding and remarkably consistent despite their length, uh, as well as hinting at some bigger picture that may not always be obvious on first listen, even though they are very texturally fascinating. Um, with Labor Days, uh, that was the plight of the disenfranchised working class that ASAP belonged to, um, a man who was successful enough to be noticed but never truly catch on to where he could escape into an environment that he was born into. And on The Impossible Kid, it was a decision more personal look at him and his struggles as a human being, stories from his youth and experiences of his adulthood that formed the greater picture of a normal, relatable, anxiety-riddled, depressed, fractured human being who just so happened to be an unrivaled talent when it came to hip-hop. Uh, that's not to say he's an artist whose headiness, density, or pretense overwhelms his work. Far from it. Uh, the tricky thing about him is that it's all disguised with irreverent and self-deprecating humor, bizarre imagery, entertaining anecdotes, and lots of just genuine earnesty. It's in a genre full of people that play characters and of people building lots of ego-driven images, Aesop Rock is a guy that is only interested in being himself. And this isn't an inherently superior approach or anything, but that doesn't stop it from being a very refreshing one, I find. Um, which means that I was definitely looking forward to this. Uh, his albums are always enjoyable. Um, they're creatively produced. They're funny. Just good time. Um, and they always have enough obvious talent to warrant taking a closer look. Um, but with the aforementioned depth, these all reward with time. Um, it took me two years to fully process a song like Blood Sandwich on The Impossible Kid, which right, on the surface so. is a fun story about uh, his brothers, but it was really this emotional, heartwarming ode to how they contributed to his uh, rough upbringing and how much he loved them. Uh, so that brings us to Spirit World Field Guide. Does it follow in this stead, or is it a bit of a slip-up or a lesser project? The short answer is it does, and it is not, respectively. Uh, the curious thing here is that this is a concept album. 
initially being the naive fool that I was, I thought the title track or the, the title and the opening track, which is admittedly somewhat superfluous, was no more than a funny tongue in cheek framing device to present us with another good crop of songs. And frankly, it could just be that, but it's more. As stated, this album serves to be a guide written by Aesop. He frames the world as a dangerous, scary place filled with supernatural creatures, hazards, and general hardships, and wishes to bestow a guide for other misfits and loners like him, using his experiences with uh, the world. And honestly, the album delivers through on this concept. It never ventures too far into that concept to become constrictive or preachy, but it allows him room, room to breathe, but also definitely works as a singular enjoyable experience if you disregard that. It's not exactly necessary, but it is required if you wanna fully understand it. Uh, and I think if you don't do that, you are selling it a bit short. Um, as the aforementioned intro and album cover imply, um, the world Aesop paints here is a mystical one. Lyrically, the way normal, everyday, and mundane things are described is given a funny fantasy adjacent coat of paint. He references himself wearing armor on At the Gates, riding a horse on Pizza Alley, or even riding through the River Styx on a boat later in the track list. This isn't window dressing either. Every song leans into this in clever ways, emphasizing the newly exposed, slightly nerdier side to him that we saw in Impossible Kid. Uh, allusions to things like Skyrim and D&D &D make it feel authentic and uh, never forced. Uh, this also hilariously clashes with the bizarre and surreal depictions of modern mundanity that he loves. The image of him riding around on a horse during a vacation in Lima while he toured, uh, <laughs> while he toured around, uh, it being an infinitely hilarious source of happiness for me. Uh, does this appeal to my inner dork as well? You fucking bet it does. Uh, but it's not just about that. Uh, the vulnerable and even more relatable Aesop from Impossible Kid is here, in full force, as this exercise in making an album as a fantasy guide of sorts gives us key insights to the kind of guy that Aesop really is. These experiences and stories feel honestly told, sure, but framing the world as this scary, foreign, raucous place filled with traps and monsters is a perfect vehicle to describe and deal with anxiety, as he very clearly and openly does. Some songs reference this, but nowhere is it more specific than on songs like Dog at the Door, uh, a brief and funny but still insightful look at the paranoia Aesop has to deal with, uh, interpreting even the smallest of things as a potentially world-ending thing that could claim his own life, with a delightful anecdote about just letting his dog out one night. Uh, I find this song particularly relatable, as Aesop's verse feels like my own inner monologue and anxiety-riddled ideation bouncing back and forth between various extremes of suspicion. Uh, as he goes like, oh, maybe it's a trap, oh, it's nothing, maybe it's a squirrel, or uh, I could be assassinated. <laughs> And there's just a, uh, there's a sincerity to this concept that melds it so beautifully with what Ian is naturally very, very good at. Uh, he's also still expertly weaving in those fun little well-read references and self-deprecating humor he always goes for, notably on one of my favorite lyrics on the record, future is bright as a fried Gamora. <laughs> one lyrical <laughs> moment that uh, amidst a heap of clever one-liners and observations. Um, and that just speaks to how Aesop does not slack, even at the age of 44. Dude's pen game is fucking untouchable. And in fact, that might be the best part about this record. Um, yeah, like, I, I get the feeling, like, I lis listen to, I listen to Labor Days, and I listen to The Impossible Kid this week, and I then listen mm -hmm. to this, and I just get the feeling, like, it always seems to me, like, it might not, he might not have even made his masterpiece yet. Like, he's not yeah. flagging in any way. Like he's he's he feels like he's constantly peaking. Um mm -hmm. and it's really fucking awesome. And just the way he wraps his music up so conceptually. Like he's an album artist. Mm -hmm. And that's so awesome to see because um that, that that kind of dedication and care to album concepts and, and album structure and hip hop is like a, a foundational aspect of like golden age and like golden age yes. hip hop and nineties hip hop and and that kind of stuff, like the, the, the classics of the era that we think of. But it's not really an art that's as, you know, Preserved. considered today. Like it's, it's, it's you, you think of like, you think of album structure and hip hop in the sense that you think about spot, you know, how it's going to present on a streaming platform and, and that sort of yeah. thing. But you don't 
necessarily get as much like genuine craft into into making an album you know as a unique cohesive experience in and of itself like yeah and it's just so cool to see it like this oh yeah i mean like that's the thing is that he may not ever even make his masterpiece because his career is going to end up being his masterpiece Mm -hmm. like the amazing quality is just like I don't know. There, there's something about the way he just sort of has been able to evolve while keeping that old school mentality intact is amazing. Because like you listen to Labor Days and then The Impossible Kid and it's like sonically these records have nothing in common other than the fact that he raps on them. And yeah, I, I think that that sort of in a lot of ways does continue here. Um, I think uh, like Lazy is just simply not in the man's vocabulary, no matter how mundane or silly he can be. Um, The gates, the opener, is the entrance to the spirit world, as he puts it, showing off his always impressive flows, as well as a blend of the more traditional production he's had on albums like None Shall Pass and Skeleton, um, but also the electronic direction that he went in on The Impossible Kid. Um, striking a really fantastic balance that leads uh, this record uh, sound to be continuously trunk knocking, fun, and innovative, uh, reminding me heavily of Run the Jewels, which checks considering that, again, Aesop, great friends with LP, very similar production sensibilities. Uh, there's an organ breakdown on this fucking song that's just absolutely sick. Uh, Button Masher is a fun little ode to DIY imagination that features Aesop building a cardboard spaceship and blasting off in it. And the samples of the guitar on this are, they fucking shred. They're so good. They're so satisfying and just like all around. This is an album that is like 98% self-produced. It, and it is astoundingly creative and consistently fun. Um, the bass in a lot of songs on the latter half of this album is blatant Mad Lib worship in all of the best ways. Uh, the ever uh, satisfying turntable scratches that are on all of his records are here. Uh, audio samples from uh, old movies like at the start of Gauze, a song about being prepared for the spirit world and all the stuff that you have to take with you. A fucking banger that flexes his positively ferocious flow. Uh, Even if Aesop phoned it in on any album, his bars and flows would probably handily outclass half of his contemporaries, and he is passionately spitting these at top speed, but with careful, controlled flows, almost to a fault, because you need to listen along with a lyric sheet to catch everything and enjoy it to its maximum potential. Sometimes Aesop goes so hard it feels like that the beats are having to ride him as opposed to vice versa. Pizza Alley is a fascinating examination of the urban sprawl and his trip to Peru, where he was able to fully enjoy a venture outside of not playing a show for the first time in years. And the beat change halfway through yields to him talking about his time in the Amazon jungle, uh, making this album feel all the more otherworldly as he talks several times about different vacations he's taken. Um, On Crystal Sword, a song with a fucking absurdly hard beat, Aesop actually said in an interview, this is meant to sound like a spirit world journal page with notes and diagrams flooding the yes, margins. Maybe a doodle of a strange flower or landscape. I had looped this bass line with no additional instruments and was going to attach it to the end uh, to an edit of a friend skateboarding. And he was like, uh, yeah, save that bass line for yourself, dude. That's too good. So I did. Um, then we go to Boot Soup featuring Aesop discovering or discussing how other people on their own journeys have affected his own, uh, uh, set to a great Mad Libish bass heavy beat, showing how he ultimately prefers his loner lifestyle, uh, showing off some of the best lyricism on the record that exists of solely great lyricism. Let me just briefly read some of this verse here. Born of an elusive baboon troop, horse flies, the backstroke, and the boot soup. Show up like an eyeball in a moon roof. One false move, dude, and you're in a food group. Old friends turn to flames in a hayride. I was kind of unimpressed with the AI. Get gutsy or crushed in the canines. Bring a steak knife, bring a trail guide. Breaking out of that boarded house. Faking normal has worn me down. Hit the road, an old misanthrope. Alone, tip me over, pour me out. Like, <laughs> this is, this is elite. What'd you, what'd you do that for? <laughs> Miss, Mr. Rock. <laughs> I would like to I would speak to Mr. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> 
the song Coveralls picks up after the last song, showing Aesop in his element of loneliness, hinted at on Boot Soup, uh, showing us that the comfort he finds in isolation that feels very earnest, not like in denial. Dude just sounds like he frequently enjoys the comfort of being alone, which honestly is kind of relatable. Like, loneliness is often horrid and awful, and I hate it, but in music, it's rarely not presented as something people are in agony or in denial about. Um, that's not to say that he doesn't talk about it like that, because he does, uh, but this song definitely speaks to that sort of uh, everyday pleasure. Uh, Jumping Coffin, bouncy as hell, a track that feels like some, uh, about a feeling that uh, some otherworldly force is calling to you and how Aesop wants to embrace it, which I think is certainly just a metaphor for inspiration or creativity and how it can feel kind of sinister and intimidating, but how he decides to channel it anyway, which feeds into a later song very, very cleverly. Uh, there's a fevery synth here that melds into a siren, and this song absolutely goes. Um, Holy Waterfall, another track about a trip that he took, this time to Cambodia, uh, which of course is framed as a fantasy adventure uh, uh, and the reverence that he kind of has for this place is found really beautifully, just sort of bleeds through. The song in and of itself feels like its own journey, uh, filled with all the details and silly observations that are quintessential in the Aesop Rock catalog. Uh, Flies follows in the stead of a very brief track that's just sort of a quick story or joke or anecdote that serves to bridge between other tracks, uh, often about how something's hilariously normal uh, sort of grounds this whole experience in a reality that you can relate to, which uh, is no less quality uh, than the other songs, despite its brevity. Just a brief little snippet, quite enjoyable. I do not mind him doing this at all. Um, Salt, another really relatable mental health topic Aesop touched on in The Impossible Kid. Uh, manic mood swings and temper flare-ups, uh, which is the subject here. A lot of poignant lyricism on this song seems to reflect the whole intense energy with its loud, bombastic production. Sleeper Car features the best beat on the album. Yes, a banging, agree. A cluttering agree. thing. It's awkward and jazzy, but Aesop rides it like a fucking bike. Another song uh, about a trip that he took to Thailand, and this entire description leads me to believe that he's trying to find this sort of search for something that he's just inexplicably drawn to, uh, a call to fulfillment that yields very entertaining results. It reminds me a lot of the song uh, Night by Devin Townsend on Ocean Machine, where he talks about being in Japan and just sort of trying to find himself. Um, One to Ten, another short track that I really, really like about his struggle with back pain. Uh, humorous, I also have back problems. I feel you, man. This song makes me laugh. Um, attaboy. Fun song presents a scenario where your camp on your spirit world journey gets raided, uh, which features a spitfire Aesop going hard on rapid aggro lyrics that are menacing and confrontational. Uh, the guitar line in the song is exquisite. Sounds like a sample from somebody like Golden Era Hendrix, another Mad Libish type beat. Uh, Koto Kushi seems to be a, a mirror image of coveralls and how loneliness can affect him negatively, feeling like the spirit world is where he belongs, not because he feels drawn there, but because he doesn't belong anywhere else, uh, which makes his actual prof uh, profoundly sound bars with raucously funny observations. Um, have a, another brief verse here that I thought was too good not to go unmentioned. Uh, Oh, potpourri of confusing powers all mashed together and shooting outward. Intel gleaned from the Prince of the Dark. Scarecrow every ten for infinity yards. When a spirit and a vessel consider living apart, it's official, I ain't sign up for mission to LARP. My call of duty stay all-consuming, even if y'all see him as a dollar movie. Look, I'm best in show. I'm still the worst there is. That pest control is no ermine myth. That floating skull just won't shut up. It's all out. Trip from below the crust. Y'all know what's up. Bad news from the Black Lung used to flatline. That shit is so last month. <laughs> Which makes me think of fucking pop star. <laughs> fucking Andy Samper. <laughs> or not Andy, but Bill Hader talks about flatlining. <laughs> <Got beyond the bond. laughs> fucking kills me every single time. Um, fixed and dilated starts off with this beautiful dreamy beat and thematically feels like a cousin to his song Supercell on Impossible Kid about supernatural forces but this one is less about paranoia and more about intense self-loathing about being possessed by evil and just 
absolutely hating yourself, which also feels connected to his embracing this potential darkness of artistic inspiration on Jumping Coffin and Button Masher. Uh, it's a shorter track, but easily one of my favorites, uh, also displaying that despite being on the back half of an album with nearly 20 songs running at an hour long, there is no messiness or laziness here. It is consistent in all regards, even thematically. Side Quest is another simple song that serves as a testament to Aesop's long, professed love of nightlife and urban culture, exploring it via skateboard. Some of the most fun deliveries appear here with his sort of delayed and then punchline deliveries make it joyous and atmospheric, and the chorus is kind of woozy and ethereal. Um, and then to close, I think that Marble Cake and The Four Winds serve as an incredible one-two punch for the end of the album, being about uh, the prize of a long-fought battle and journey and a desire to move forward despite arriving at your destination, respectively. Uh, Marble Cake is all about the journey, not destination mentality and wants to celebrate it as a fun and potentially joyous experience. And Aesop's final sentiment about moving forward is earnest and clearly he wants those who have followed this guide to the end to keep pursuing the things that make their lives worth living. Getting your hands dirty, living it to the fullest. Uh, it's a song which Aesop has meant to be encouraging along with Marble Cake, saying that he didn't want this to end on an exclamation point, so to speak, uh, a definite ending, but leaving room for a continuation of another journey, ending it, as he says, on an ellipsis. And I will say, upon first listen, this album uh, I, I was just like, this is really great. This is solid shit from Aesop. This is pretty much exactly what I expected. Um, but I wouldn't say that it ranks up there with the Impossible Kid or Labor Days. And then I just couldn't stop listening to it. I listened to it over and over and over again, sometimes multiple times in one day. And I got more out of it with each preceding listen to the point where I would say, I do think this is as good as Labor Days and The Impossible Kid, at least comparable. Maybe if I had to pick a least favorite out of the three, it might be it but only tentatively. It's just, it is a hip hop album that I think the genre sorely needed um, just because it is, it is full conceptual, substantial, but it also just has this undeniable fun spirit and in a year of just constant fucking pain, horror and misery, I need to listen to something that just makes me wanna get up out of bed in the morning and be like, yeah, I love this, it's great. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. Great review. I am super eager to see what you all have to say about it, just because I am obviously the most storied person here with it. So getting to introduce any sect of my musical taste to people, always curious well, to see well, how that Well, do you mind if I go next in that case? Nope. So, um, not to bury the lead, I like this album very much. Um, this is going to be a recurring theme with me today. Um, but Shocker. yeah, um, yeah, my battle with this record, I suppose, has been to a degree decoding it in a way. Um, yep, and it's not like, um, I think Aesop Rock is probably very clear to himself what the spirit world means to him on a metaphorical level. I don't really care what it means to him. What I care about is what it means Savage. to me once I've listened to this record. Um, and the answer to that is somewhat multifaceted. Um, in the last year, two years, four years, the world has changed an extraordinary amount. Um, and I think everyone is affected by the way in which this world is changing and you can often feel like you are moving through a land unfamiliar to you, which is not helped by the fact a lot of people are already dealing with their own changes in their own lives and their own problems. And to me, the spirit world is the meeting between those two points where not only has your life become unfamiliar, but the world in which it takes place is unfamiliar also. Um, yeah. And this might just be me projecting hugely because that's very much what my life is. Um, but that's sort of where I'm at. Very early on, on the song uh, Button Masher, I was reminded by the hook of, um, I've never seen so many colors. 
um, of the movie Stalker by Andrei Tarkovsky, um, where they uh, cross the boundary into the new world and the film changes from black and white to color cinematography. Um, especially as at this early point on the album, you feel like um, this is, you are still embarking on this journey. Every song still feels like another stage in the preparation for your travels. Um, and Stalker is especially a movie about going to what is equivalently a spirit world where your deepest subconscious elements are made real. Every musical choice feels like it's designed to, to feel alien and strange and, and psychedelic, but still inherently musical and, and melodic. Um, the introduction, the um, introductionary song, Hello from the Spirit World, is it's charming and quirky, but also threatening and ominous and foreboding. Um, the way the, um, the synths sound like some kind of unholy matrimony between steel drums and noise synths. Um, and in my notes, yeah, in my notes I have it written as, um, it feels like I'm about to play the Spirit World video game and this is the loading screen music. Yep. Um, I see that. Even uh, lots yeah. of moments on here that give the feeling of like a video game mm -hmm. sure. in an indirect way. A song um, titled "Side Quest," for instance. Yeah, oh, yeah. That, Button and Masher. Mm, yeah. Mm. Uh, you, those two. But I was thinking of like mm. musical elements that I'll get to in more when I talk about it. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. But um, this album constantly does. This supports my reading of the album, I suppose. This album constantly makes allusions to personal struggle intertwined with with imagery allusions to sort of the state of the world at the moment there's um there's one line i caught in the song that alludes to um i can't find it in my notes but it alludes to police brutality um in the song gores there's the lines i give free love and a plague mask yeah um that one stuck out yeah <sighs> this, this album is this is another point sack to the fucking brim with amazing one-liners um like uh where am I? Um, I love that river, one. <laughs> the river boils when it sees me. Um, yeah. Oh, I deeper love that through, refrain. So deeper good. Through, deeper through the death and gore come out the other side. Um, and it's just lots of hellish imagery. Um, and the thing that I find interesting about this album the most is that the allegory and the personal and the political are never not constantly intertwined like a braid. Um, and I just thought this was a really, really exciting record, um, full of amazing hooks. Like with even on the second song, the gates, with the the hook on the chorus, um, I was at the gate gates. I was, and then I'm not going to try to do the rest of the chorus, but it's all just amazingly sticky. Um, See, that's the funny thing, Sersha. That it, it's sort of like Aesop himself acknowledges that he is not known for having particularly like effective hooks and is more just like the lyrical spitter guy um and i believe in anthony fantano's review for this he also said that there was just a lack of hooks on this album and i just have to question both of those because i don't what what are they talking about yeah, i'm sorry i'm sorry can you run that by me again I'm, they I'm they both like aesop rock himself thought that he isn't good at hooks he constantly jokes about it, but Anthony Fantano's biggest complaint with this is that it has a lack of hooks, and I'm just like, dude, this is way hookier than Impossible Kid. Mm, yes, it way is. Way more. I was going to say the same yeah. thing. It is. He's yeah. gotten better at, at writing hooks. Yeah. I don't even. I don't even know how to. Say, I don't know where to start with that. <laughs> Not sure. I, I found I'm it tired. beguiling, but Sersha is correct. Dude yeah, has I been was... on one this year. Mm. I have been on one. Yeah, that's a line. Uh, I've got a, I've got a reference yeah. to that in my review. Motherfucker, I am on one. I am one. on <laughs> one. <laughs> on one. I mean, there's several points, actually, <clears throat> that line also, that really reminded me of uh, Open Mike Eagle's delivery as well. Yeah. Um, yes. They, um, you'll be pleased to hear that there is a song that they have, that, we, that um, mm -hmm. uh, a bonus track, I think, on mm -hmm. A Possible Kid, which is a collab between, yeah. 
Yep, yeah, it's him, great. And, yeah. Why am I yeah. not speaking properly? It's I know what you mean. It's fine. I know what you were going to say. It's funny. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's another song in my notes of which I can't find. Um, that really reminded me of the refrain in Merlin's verse on Jouvert, where he says, what's up? I mean, what's up? Um, and um, also um, this references uh, Raising Hell by Run DMC yes. at one point <laughs> yeah. in that one as well. Um, right next to Eraserhead, which yep. is those two pieces of media meeting is pretty much the pitch <laughs> of the record. So, so actually, the moment I heard that, I'm like, so she's going to cover it. Yep, on this. that's <laughs> yeah. exactly what I thought. I was just like, that's... <laughs> Aesop coming through with the Saoirse core. Considering it's one of my ten favorite films of all time, like, what yeah, expect from me. Um, there's a song, Crystal Sword, uh, where he pictures himself, uh, like persecuted by a like Lovecraftian town, um, before he is revealed to be satanic. Um, I can't remember the, yeah, um, it's in the lyrics. It's cleverer when he says it. Um, I also really love the song Dog at the Door, where he pictures himself sort of running through woods, avoiding traps. That particularly reminded me of Open Mike Eagle. Um, the song Gauze is excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah, just um, Sleeper Car and Jumper Coffin are particular favourites of mine. Yeah, and me too. I think the back end of this record is is the best end of this record. Um, Good fucking song, take, honestly. Code of Cushy fixed and delayed marble cake. Um, the problem is that this record is, is, is long, for a start, it's over an hour long, I think. Um, hour and three. And the, like, the bass is really, really strong in all of them. Um, really prevalent. Um, and his vocals are mixed, forward in the mix and quite compressed in all of them. Um, and what that does for an hour of just a lot of bass and a lot of pretty compressed middle range vocals is, is it gives me a level of ear fatigue that I find tiring. Um, it's just like, ah, oh, more bass. Lovely. I, I'm, uh, symp- I'm, I'm partially sympathetic to what you're saying. I'll get onto it when I review as well. But yeah, sure. I definitely understand what you mean. Like you give me one song like that, or even a few songs like that. I will have that. It's a wonderful experience. It just... Uh, on an experiential level, I couldn't help it. I felt a bit tired by the end of this record. And the fact that the back half is so excellent, it just leaves me slightly more disappointed because you get to a song like Marble Cake, which is one of my, probably my favourite song on the record. Um, yeah, and, I, and my ears are too tired to appreciate it in context. Um, and it's, that's just a bit of a disappointment for me. But, yeah. um, it's, but that is my only critique of the record because it's consistently immaculately written immaculately produced um well one of my critiques is about the production but every song by itself is wonderfully produced the beats um, they the beats do they be do knocking they yeah do. Just, they be constantly. do knocking <laughs> sorry look i'm, I'm <laughs> fucking i'm losing my mind mm. And if you want to take that allegory of the personal and the political and the situation we're in in the world to the end of this record, on the personal level, he comes out smarter about how to live and more aware of his surroundings. You feel like he has learned to live within his spirit world. But the biggest revelation, and this comes up again and again and again on the record, is that it's not, it's the realization that it's not like the world has changed when you went through the looking glass. Going through the looking glass is its own enlightenment to the world you already existed in, and the fact that it was already screwed up and had these problems that going to the spirit world showed you. Um, And that's why he's maybe smarter moving through the world now. It's because he sees it for what it is. That's my take on the record anyway. I, mm. I like that take a lot. I think that yeah. there's like, I, I think that that's probably going to be a very undervalued thing about this album is the conceptual and emotional journey that it goes on is a very mm. clear and definitive one. But I feel like if you're just not looking for that, it's going to be something that might pass you by. But I feel mm. like it's nevertheless very strong. Mm. Yeah, no, I liked it very much. Um, and I think this record is almost definitely not going to get the widespread 
love and acclaim amongst like mainstream hip hop people that it deserves, but it should. It's going to get, you know, the, the amount of love that an Aesop rock record gets, you know? Which is yeah. probably about as much as the Impossible Kid got, which is a decent amount. It's just that like, well, you just know. Like, the reason it won't be huge, huge is that just, what Aesop does is just not like what is you know what yeah. mainstream hip hop is all about right now i would no. love for there to become there to be a new era of this kind of lyrical style to emerge but that's just not yes. kind of where culturally we were at but it's it sure. doesn't really matter because aesop's still out here doing his shit and and mm. not sort of sacrificing any of his artistic integrity um and that's awesome yeah, yeah. absolutely i feel like uh this album does what all great concept albums should do is where the concept only magnifies everything that is already great about the record from a base level and fully diving into the concept and understanding what it's getting at only uh, widens and broadens one's appreciation for the record. Um, Cause the first time I heard this, I was like, uh, um, I, I, I just wasn't vibing with it for whatever reason. Uh, but this is an episode in particular where I'm glad that we all make ourselves listen to albums as many times as we can in a given week. Mm, um, absolutely. Just, just as a general rule. Um, because once again, even though I thought it was kind of eh on first listen, I kept I, I can't stop listening to it and I couldn't then <laughs> either um, because it just there's something so approachable about it um, like this is why I fully just I cannot understand the uh, the hooks complaint it's just abject nonsense frankly um, I walk around my house going, the river boils when it sees me. Just fucking randomly like a crazy one person. Of, one of the first things in the album is the dude going, because I was at the gates. And like, burning. And then it's just hard. And like, what? <laughs> How do you know? That is, that is yeah. like stickier than, 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 you know, a sticky Molasses. thing. Molasses. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Stickier than a really sticky thing. I love that Devin Townsend album. Ah! <laughs> anyway, <laughs> fucked up my whole flow again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <sighs> Just talking about how how picky and approachable it is, and yeah. I find that that is the best way to sort of make the concept as holistic as possible. Because I feel like a lot of what this album centers around, or at least my interpretation of it, is sort of switching perception of anxiety and sort of isolation and depression inducing events or environments to a sort of, you know, a fantasy. Um, this is something I did a lot when I was a kid, particularly in <laughs> elementary school. Cause I would oh, yeah. just fucking pretend to make it through the day. Um, and it's, I, to be completely honest, I do it in a more, you know, self-aware way now, but I still sort of apply the escapism of pretending that you're like playing a video game or you're on a quest or something just as a way to cope with the fact that the world is massive and unknowable and scary. And I not only have I never heard that sort of idea expounded upon in an album this well, I've just never heard that idea expounded upon in an album. <laughs> So, I mean, like, it's just listening to something like this is so refreshing on so many levels. Because, one, it's a hip-hop album that is committed to being an album, first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, like, as, as we've said earlier in the 
the era of streaming, you know, that's that's hard to come upon. Uh, another is that it's a 21 song album that is committed to being an album and not a, a shotgun of half baked ideas. Um, and for another, that the concept is so unified on every aspect, like just in the way that it incorporates its musical motifs to the lyricism. And my, my God, this man can write. He can, he, he's done it. He <laughs> invented the English language. <laughs> um, Concept album about time traveling to invent English when Aesop rock. I mean, please. <laughs> I I will I will kickstarter this. Um Yeah. Yeah, this shit is just really good. And I feel like it would be easy especially in this year where the uh inclination is for an artist to lean into the 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 misery. Mm-hmm. Um I just find it so wonderful to find something that talks about the subject matter in a way that ultimately feels sort of uh, joyous and really energizing. Um, yeah, I, I, the only thing I have in the way of a complaint is just that the pacing can be a little awkward sometimes. Um, I feel like some of the interlude tracks like Dog at the Door and 1 to 10 especially are kind of jarring in the way that they sort of switch up the pace when I feel like it would have been better off to just sort of keep going. Um, The reason that I can't be all that mad about that is because they're funny as hell. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> um, he's, just, he's like moaning about his back from one to ten. It's like, <laughs> it, it, like it's my least favorite track on the album, and it maybe has my favorite line. It's like, on a scale of one to ten, uh, how bad does this feel? Or you know something. I'm paraphrasing here because can't yeah. remember exactly. But he's like, well, Doc, I gotta be honest. It feels like I lost a friend. <laughs> <laughs> Oh God, it's so fucking good. Yeah, it's just like such a a a, a left turn from what you'd expect from uh from a rhyme scheme like that, and it, it just it works. This man is a living thesaurus, and I love it. And I just I could just sit here and gush for uh, probably the next hour about how I love nearly everything that this album does. Um, But, you know, you two have done that so well already, and Tyler's going to do it well again. So, like, really, I just, I think Jake's breakdown is immaculate. Cersei's exploration of her sort of emotional reaction to it was enlightening. And, you know, Tyler does nothing but spit genius on here. So fucking, (laughs) you know, this shit knocks. You know, Morgan, I I was the most worried that you would not fuck with this. So I'm just A, really glad that you did. And B, also just like, I mean, I don't know how to put this delicately, man, but Aesop Rock and you were the same fucking human being. I I got (laughs) that impression. (laughs) Um so, but yeah, but this is the thing about this guess, album, though, is that it um, provokes interesting discussion about it because yeah, of yeah. how it is. Oh yeah, do, yeah I feel like my favorite thing about like the uh, yeah. the sort of like every rap album, every rapper has a sort of persona, and I feel like Aesop Rock's persona is just that he's a dude. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I got back pain. Yeah, it's like I got back pain. This shit is whack. And I'm like I. This is how I would rap if I could. <laughs> that's, so, the, that's the thing about it, too, is that it's just like, it's, you know, I'm not trying to say like this is an inherently bad thing, but how fucking strange is it to hear a, tw- an, a hip-hop album in 2020 where there is not a variation of the line, boy, I do be fucking bitches. Not once. Not yeah. one time. Yeah. 
Yeah, like like Aesop's the Aesop's the the rapper you could kind of put on and with your parents in the car. Yeah. And with, without feeling like you're compromising something. Yeah, like yeah. you're just like not putting on like, oh, this guy's rap name is Ronald McDonald. And he's the kid-friendly rapper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Anyway. <laughs> Morgan fucking died. Okay, so... Um, I will be relatively brief, and that is just because most of what I have to say has already been expressed better than I could express it. Um, I love this album, and I've grown to love this album, and I don't differ in any meaningful, massive way from the consensus. Um, And I'm, again, echoing what Morgan said, I'm glad that we had a reason, a need to spend time with this before we review it because mm. just like like i listened to the other two labor days and impossible kid once i could not review those even though i've heard them i would need to spend more time with them and having done that with this um has been really richly rewarding it is the best feeling in the world when we discuss an album on the podcast that i feel good about because i've spent so much time with it that i would not ordinarily spend with it if we weren't reviewing it. That's one of the greatest um, things about this podcast to me is it gives me an excuse to really dive into shit that I would listen to once or twice normally and move on with my life, regardless of even if I loved it, just because I like I listen to so many records. And it reminds me of the importance of actually spending time with records you enjoy or records that you're mixed on, like the importance of giving it those second, that second chance, that third chance even, it's a lesson that I've needed to learn this year because I've become so swept up in just like listening to records, listening to records, listening to records because there's so much I want to hear. Um, but doing this podcast and having a reason to actually slow down with some shit and, and really dig into it has been the best, most valuable lesson I've learned this year with regard to music. So anyway, uh, I just think this is a, yeah. sorry, there's a bit of a tangent, but I think this is kind of like the perfect example of that. No, absolutely. You're totally right. Um, that said, uh, I'm going to kick off, uh, just because I have so many not positive things to say about this record, I'm going to kick off with one major complaint I do have. Um, and it's already kind of been raised. I don't think that the record is too long. I think the record is the perfect length, frankly. But I do have issues with uh, some of the mixing decisions, particularly the vocals. And normally with a record that I love, and this is a record that I love, I wouldn't let kind of tiny production issues sort of get in the way of it. And to a large extent, I haven't, because I I still really enjoy listening to this. But Mm. I do find the mixing of the vocals so prominently um, to be, like, it sounds like he's rapping, like, right into your ear directly. (laughs) And I do find it uh, annoying. And it's like, difficult for me to process that because everything he's saying and the way he's saying it is amazing um but it's just a strange mixing decision and the problem with it is that i have to turn the album down to listen to it and that sucks because this is an album i want to blast and i'm like and i put it on i i i I, I will admit uh, the last few listens i've skipped over the intro just because i want to get to the gates like so quickly the intro is good um, but I put the gates on, it immediately comes bursting out the gate with that amazing beat. I'm like fucking cranking the shit up because it's like yeah. hard as fuck. And then he comes in and he's awesome, but he's so fucking loud. And I'm like, ah, I actually know I need to turn it down because mm. it's hurting my ears. And it's a real shame. Um, yeah, it's my only complaint about this record. And I will say to a certain extent, it has come to bother me less and less. Like the, the last, most recent listen I had, my fourth listen just before we recorded mm. this, I really wasn't noticing it too much at all. Um, and I was certainly enjoying it in spite of that. But it is like, if, in terms of reviewing a record, it's definitely a legitimate criticism I have. Um, it would be nice to have it remixed a little bit better in that regard. But... Uh, and I was trying to think about like why he might have made this decision because it's not an issue on any of his other records that I've heard. And I think perhaps he's trying to give the sense of like being the guide, so being this kind of like voice yeah. overseeing all. 
and and kind of like the skull on the cover um that maybe represents him or maybe the the the, the deer represents him i'm not sure but um anyway my only complaint and it's out of the way it's all gold from here um the gates has a great instrumental as i've mentioned this plinking synthesizer melody that I really love. It describes the anticipation of entering this spirit world, um, which is obviously kind of metaphorical or allegorical or whatever, but we'll get, kind, of, kind of get into that. Um, it's one of, the song is one of Ace's most lyrically accomplished and impressive tracks that I've heard, which is no small feat. Um, and though it certainly has a lot of company in that regard, the way he rides this consistent delirious flow, it's just pure fucking joy to experience. The way he punctuates the end of each verse with a staccato single word delivery, like a finger snap before launching into the chorus is just like, oh, that's it. This is the good shit. Button Masher has this classic sounding beat that simulates the zero gravity theme of the type of the track, I think, the space exploration thing, bounces across the mix, um, but it also moves forward. It has a video game kind of space invaders-y feel that uh, I think obviously nicely complements the top, the topical subject matter so the space theme but specifically the fantasy of space travel is a form of this idea of escapism uh, bringing this notion of the spirit world into the realm of the tangible um, this thing anyone can experience so long as they have the desire and i like the way the way this is structured this I, this concept is structured is such that the spirit world is introduced as this kind of concept at the beginning and and then it's it seems like this tangible like place he's referring to, but then gradually by incorporating um, images of fantasy and, and imagination in tracks like Button Masher, it becomes the, the metaphorical level that that concept exists on where it's ostensibly like referring to, you know, kind of getting in touch with yourself and kind of being truthful to yourself and, and, and uncovering kind of like a sense of realness um, that might've been battered down by the world. Um, he kind of doesn't ever overtly kind of spell that out to you. He just kind of gradually, you know, suggests it and, and, and puts the pieces in place so you can make that conclusion. And it's just such, it's real craftsmanship. Um, and I really, really love that. Um, I was going to say as well, I wrote about Bud and Masher, this whole song and the imagination theme and the rocket theme, like the whole thing has the same energy as the SpongeBob episode with the imagination box. I keep thinking of it <laughs> yeah. for some reason while I was listening to that song. Great track. Um, Gauze is the first, I think, detailed description of the spirit world as this kind of like, um, you know, concept. Uh, it's a warning of the layers of darkness that can be found there kind of the deeper you go into this realm or the deeper you go into your mind, I guess. Um, and the track itself is this absolutely fucking dizzying display of technical ability from Ace. His flows on the song are just stupid. Um, it's hard to argue against him as one of the most talented MCs working today. What he does uh, should be a felony. Um, <laughs> The image of Ace sort of um, listening to Run DMC's Raising Hell while making raisin bread is like such a funny and, <laughs> and line that perfectly captures his energy um, yep. and the different sides of him. Yeah. Uh, Pizza Alley describes a transformative visit to Peru that led him down the road to developing the concept for this record. It has one of the more amusing hooks of the album. Um, Find me a strange hill to die on. Never let me die yeah. on a regular hill. Like that's probably my favorite hook just because of how funny it is and how clever it is in terms of wordplay. Um, but the verses are absolute heat as well. And, and you'd be doing yourself a disservice to overlook them. Um, there's one particular verse I want to shout out uh, or a series of lines. Um, Electric eels killed two of my best friends, <laughs> yeah. said the local to the gringo, then dove, off, dove in off the pirogue in a cloud of smoky mapacho. They boat in from Iquitos, mosquitoes on the wall of the Amazonian ethos, off to bounce a light off any hairy eyeball in the basin. Wild pig, owl, baby, caiman, coral snakes that drape down from the timbers like the six fingers of Satan. They only speak in S's. You cannot get an amen. Just, I could go on. Holy shit! Again, the wordplay, the, 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 the absolute mastery of, of, of like linguistics, not to sound super sciencey about it, but like the way he kind of incorporates 
all these different kind of techniques of, of the ways in which sound can relate in language is really, really like God level. Um, and also this song has one of my favorite couplets of the whole record, which has already been, um, the second half of this line has already been mentioned, but the full couplet is really funny. Um, Humming muddy waters, motherfucker, I am on one. Just that's a cool reference to muddy, mu mu muddy waters as well. And also just like, it's super fucking, uh, super fucking clever because like this whole song is about being in this kind of like jungly wilderness like yep. traveling down an amazonian river and so like yeah there would be muddy water there it's like fuck dude <laughs> it's like what are you you're, what are you fucking doing to me man oh and that that parallel i didn't even pick up on that until like the last listen the muddy yep. waters thing i was like oh fuck and i just know there's like fucking hundreds of things like that in this record that yeah. I haven't even found yet and it's like that that feeling of knowing that is so fucking hype um, and this record is just stamped with moments like that um, Crystal Sword is designed to evoke a page in the Spirit World Journal as Jake's already said and as such it's one of the most stream of consciousness lyrical exercises uh, it feels completely formless but it's also entirely engrossing and it leaps with aplomb from image to image it has a novel's worth of imagery, ideas, and scenery. It paints its own entire self-contained world while still building the concept of the record as a whole. Uh, it also has a bass line that makes me incredibly erect. Um, the buzzing, wheedly melody and stark percussion of Boot Soup is one of many examples of restlessly innovative and inventive instrumentals on this record. The breakdown in this beat in the second half of the song where it switches up and it's like this new deceiving melody. It's like, oh shit, we put, oh fuck. Yeah, that's mm, song. Uh, Coveralls has this delightful squelching beat atop which Ace whirls delirious imagery and wordplay after four listens. I can, I don't even know if I know what the song is even about, but I just know I love listening to it. Um, Jumping Coffin has another one of the more engaging, bouncy, melodically memorable instrumentals. It could have easily been a hit. Uh, Ace could have sold this beat to someone big and like made fucking millions off of it, I reckon. Yep. But he kept it for his own album and fucking God bless him because it's a fucking kick-ass beat. Um, lyrically, the song refers to letting in an energy that calls you to the spirit world. Uh, in other words, calling you to awaken new, fresh, rejuvenated. It's a fucking, you know, empowerment anthem in a sense. Uh, and following, obviously, a year that we've been in a stagnant quarantine, it's practically fucking inspirational. Um, also, uh, we have to appreciate the line, it's all jazz, like an alphabet to Saul Bass. <laughs> What a fucking king. Holy shit. Yeah, no, fucking, I, I love this so much. Uh, Holy <laughs> Waterfall. I think Jumping jumping Coffin and Holy Waterfall back to back is the most like bang and double bill of the record, I think. Uh, Holy Waterfall has this great groove and Ace uses the same vocal pattern across the entire track, which gives it, uh, he doesn't switch up his flow, I don't think, um, which gives it this kind of continuous feel that's damn near hypnotic and it kind of just pulls you along effortlessly. It's really masterful shit. Uh, it's a king at the height of his powers. Um, and it also obviously describes a trip to Cambodia, similarly revelatory as the Peru journey in Pizza Alley. And I, Jake's already touched on this, this notion of like, travel in this record in like both the, the tangible real sense and the metaphorical sense this uh, sense of self-exploration through actual exploration is super cool and, and 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 i love the way that it's consistent across this record as well more or less um i didn't write much about the song salt which but it's awesome it has a pixies reference in it to their most underrated album trompe le monde which is fucking awesome um go ace fucking yeah. What fucking Ian guy? This fucking Ian guy. Um, <laughs> uh, Sleeper Cell has one of the louder, more disruptive and noisy beats uh, on the record. And at this point, it's appreciated, I think, in providing a subversive burst to truly showcase Ace's talent for writing off kilter shit, as well as perfectly complementing the disorienting scene that he's setting deep in the spirit world wilderness. 
Um, this is also one of tr one of few tracks I think where that vocal mixing I've complained about I think actually does work because it lends him kind of an almost deranged raving quality in this song, which is very suitable for it. Um, yeah, definite definite record highlight. Um, at this point, I will take a, a little bit of an aside to shout out um, the shorter tracks here. Uh, I don't. I will be honest and say I don't think any of them are particularly bad or even mediocre. They're all quite good actually, but uh, I do feel as though they don't quite fit because they are really the only point. And perhaps I haven't really unpacked them fully, but to me it seems like they are points on the record where he seems to deviate from the theme or from this kind of spirit world imagery and, and talking about kind of other things. And that's fine but it, feel, it does kind of feel like it disrupts the consistency of the concept. And also, this is a really shallow complaint too, but I also just kind of wish these songs were longer. I get why they're short. I think Ace has said he kind of wants to explore this idea of doing more short form stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, they do feel a bit out of place on this record. Even if I enjoy the sentiment of something like Dog at the Door, which is just great storytelling, again, the way he kind of, gets you into that mindset is just very 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 impressive um i think one to ten is funny I, although i will shout out there's one shorter track here which i think is awesome for a very specific reason and that's side quest um which i think uh what's cool about this track is that ace is actually rapping in six four time like as opposed to conventional four four time that most rappers rap in um and and you don't there's a reason you don't see um rappers using like unusual time signature beats or rapping in unusual time signatures very often and the reason is that's fucking difficult to do mm -hmm. really fucking difficult to do um it's it's harder to do it's maybe even harder to do than just rapping fast and and, and staying legible like like ace does but he pulls it off here um the he, he has to, and he has to employ those pauses that jake's referred to on this track he has to employ those to stay on beat and that might throw you off initially, but I mean, once you count the beats, it becomes clear what he's doing. And honestly, I don't really know that I've heard many rappers try and do something like it. I mean, that's really strange. Danny Brown does it a little bit as well, and, and a, a yeah. few other rappers do it too, but just not very often. And certainly not while incorporating the speed that Ace is using here as well. Yeah. It's very, very impressive. Um, and again, like the subject matter of the song, I think is skateboarding, which makes it feel yep. a bit um, disjointed from the rest of the concept. Haha, <laughs> side quest. Um, but it's still it's still a good song, and I really wanted to highlight that impressive element of it. Uh, Add a boy has a fusion esque bass lick that feels ripped straight from like a, a record like Miles Davis is on the corner, or even like a Herbie Hancock album or something. But it also has this melodic drone that gives the whole thing an eerie feel. Uh, it's also notable, I think, for being one of the more stream of consciousness tracks in the sense that it's a three minute song that's just one single constant verse. There's no hook, it's just pure bars constantly. And that's quite impressive, I think. The fact that I didn't even notice that that's what it was the first couple of times I heard the album. And then I read the lyrics and I realized, oh, okay, this is one verse. It's always nice when, when rappers can do that and it doesn't feel like they're dragging or the song is dragging. Um, Oh, big shout out to the double bill. Again, some real great double bills on this record, like mm. the Gates and Button Masher, um, fucking Jumping jumping Coffin and Holy Waterfall, and in particular, probably the most, the best double bill in terms of reflecting concept on this record is Kodakushi and Fixed and Dilated. Mm. Uh, they form a late album double bill about isolation and collapse and, and self-loathing and doubt um, Kodakushi has an almost deranged fuzzing cascading beat with ace painting portraits of the dangers of getting lost in the spirit world lost in yourself, losing your guide, struggling to find your way again uh, fixed and dilated employs demonic and in aces where it's evil imagery atop a gently sad and spear melody before then adding this propulsive drum sample and bringing everything together in this really disorienting way that should not work as well as it does Again, the fact that most of this was self-produced, I am in awe. Is there anything this fucking guy cannot do? Anything that he can't do? Miss we, we say miss once, but like, fucking mm. don't be able to do something once. Like, geez. Don't hit a bullseye. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, wow. Um, yeah. 
Uh, Marble Cake is the fantastic climax of the record. It has a beat that absolutely slams and a message that the journey to the spirit world is more valuable than existing in that realm itself. It's a fairly straightforward analogy for grabbing life by the horns that Ace nevertheless expresses in a way that completely avoids cliche or sentiment. It re it's rendered completely through the imagery, the writing, and the poetry. Um, and that's, that's what every... MC should try to do is is convey a concept without spelling it out to the audience necessarily. That's what I like so much about what Ace does. Uh, Four Winds is a great epilogue, ties a bow around the record, brings the theme of Marvel Cake home more directly and in a more overtly inspirational way. Uh, keep moving forward. Um, yeah, I have nothing bad to say about the songs themselves, other than the fact that I think that the interludes, which I like are ill-fitting here, and the vocal mixing could certainly have very easily been better, but minor complaints in terms of just how much fun I've had with this album. I'm going to be going back and listening to the Ace records I haven't heard yet, as well as listening to Impossible Kid and Labor Days again and again and again until I unpack them further. Uh, what a great discovery. I, I mean, thank you, Jake, for making sure we review this, because it's introduced me to Aesop who I've been slacking. I, I should have listened to him sooner. I'm so glad that I'm here now and, and I had a great time. I'm just glad that he seems to be a universal hit just because it's just like when I think of it like in theory now, I'm just like, yeah, why wouldn't everyone like this? I, this is so much everyone's <laughs> shit. Yeah, especially this one, I think. This album yeah, it's, it was a great album to do it with too. Mm. Absolutely. Fun yeah. fact, by the way, um, Kodo Kushi is a, the Japanese word to describe the uh, a situation in which someone dies alone and is left for a long period of time without being found. Oh. Stephen Wilson's oh. hand cannot erase type beat. Interesting. That's <laughs> We're, we're going to talk about that bitch at some point. <laughs> yep. Today's sure. episode is dedicated to Breaking Morgan, slowly. Um. <laughs> Today's sponsor brought to you in part by Breaking Morgan. <laughs> that's, All right, I love that's, that's never, Skilligan show. That's, that's never not what the goal of this podcast <laughs> is in some way. <laughs> uh, Alright, let's go to our favorite tracks and ratings for this bitch, because I think we have done a great job at discussing it. Mm. Indeed. Unquestionably. Um, let's do reverse order this time. Mm -hmm. I'll go first, if, if that's okay. Um, my three favorite tracks are... Um, let me think very carefully about what I say next. It's an embarrassment of riches. Yeah, for real. I'm going to say Gauze. I'm going to say yeah, Gauze. Um, sleeper Cell. And Sleeper Car. And I will also throw in Crystal Sword. Uh, least favorite is probably f Flies, I guess. Um, I'm going to give this album an 8.5 out of 10. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. So that, that is then moi. Um, and I want to shout out, I was at the gates. Um, and I also want to shout out Marble Cake. And I also want to shout out Pizza Alley. Or Gauze. Good Currently good choose. Uh, both, both good great. songs. Top four. There we go. Um, <laughs> Fuck it. Uh, I don't know, one to ten for a least favorite track. I don't know. Um, it's Who hard cares? to choose a least favorite track in a stacked album. Like yes, this. very much so. Um, and I'm going to give this album an eight out of ten. Morgan. So, my three favorites are uh, "Jumping Coffin." Yep. I say marble cake and gauze. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, least favorite is probably one to ten. Um, um, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get hit this with a nine and a half. You scandalous hooker. Well, Ain't following in that trend, <laughs> my three oh my favorite God. tracks are Marble Cake, uh, Sleeper Car, and Pizza Alley. God, there's so many songs that I still left out there that hurts. Least favorite flies, I guess. And uh, yeah, I give this a 9.5 out of 10. Oh, yes. Okay. So... Now that we've reviewed that, let's move on now to our second review of the, the week, which is mm-hmm. obviously uh, something which comes with a high level of anticipation. Uh, our review of Orteker's second album of 2020 plus. Um, and I have got, uh, I have to apologize, I have an unusual amount of backstory, not backstory, but like context for this record mm-hmm. that I'll try and get through. And I'll just do my review first, I think, because it's a lot and I want to get it out. Um, uh, I had a lot to say about this album. Um, so, where are we? It was suggested from the start. Way back in March or April, uh, during a brief Q&A engagement with fans on one of their multiple streams, on the DJ platform Mixler, Sean confirmed that the band had two albums ready, in addition to the eight-hour compilation of live material that they released on, in April as well. The first of those studio records, Sign, arrived with much fanfare last month, uh, but felt such a contained, cohesive, and satisfying singular experience that thoughts of a follow-up, to me, seem strange. Perhaps it would be a glorified EP, the typical kind of leftovers batch that the duo have released in conjunction with nearly all of their studio records up to and including XI. But that didn't, but, but that didn't sit right either. A fan confirmed on a message board that they had knowledge of two albums with the same design being printed, one orange and one green. And so after the ostensible orange album emerged, fans began to speculate about how the green album might be presented and more pertinently, what its relationship with sign would be as a project. Would it be a continuation of that sound or would it be something to complement that sound or would it be something different entirely? It turns out in my estimation, at least the truth of the matter is somewhere in the middle. Plus is in presentation and release ostensibly its own discrete record. It differs in structure from Sign, as well as it presenting a notable stylistic counterpoint to that record's primarily beatless exercises and colliding waves of texture, sounds that kind of brush together but don't necessarily clash. However, the packaging is obviously similar between the two records. They both have an identical logo design, as and also another relevant point is that they is the warp release codes because each album has a kind of like stock code uh, in the warp catalog. Um, Plus's release code is 338 uh, and it's notably close to Sign's release code which is 329 Uh, but most pertinently uh, the numbers in both of those codes add to 14 which seems to support the notion that both of these albums are to be considered Orteker's 14th album. And this is not without precedent either. Warp codes on previous Orteca releases have kind of gestured in one way or another at the placement of that record in the studio album chronology. And of course, Orteca also like to hint at the um, number of the album in the title itself, like Try Repeati, Try for Three, and Draft 7.30, seventh album. Um, And XI, obviously, XI, the Roman numeral for 11, which is what that album, where that album comes. So, yeah, so it seems like the hints are suggesting that Sign and Plus are like one single album or one single project or something like that. Um, I mean, but that said, this is maybe not concrete evidence for argue to argue for the two as a single record, um, but certainly it does seem to me that having spent a great deal of time with both of these albums, that they're kind of intended to be two sides of the same coin, absolutely differing in approach and focus, but also interrelating with each other in curious ways, even referencing each other at points 
sometimes overtly on each album. The two are companion albums, as Jake introduced them at the very beginning of this episode. Um, but they're companion albums with neither being the primary. And that part's quite pru- quite quite crucial. Excuse me. That quite part crucial. is quite crucial. Because uh, I, I think it's fair to consider Plus a companion to Sign, as it's been billed by many. But I think that's only fair in as much as you consider Sign a companion to Plus. There's yeah. not like one that's the higher in the hierarchy of importance. Um, the two can be listened back to back to provide a stimulating two hour experience. Um, though certainly one where the two halves would differ more starkly in the approach to the two hour long halves of XI, for instance, which are, mm-hmm. that's a record that's very clearly cleaved into two halves, but the two halves are quite similar. Um, alternatively, uh, a particularly interesting and illuminating exercise for me and a lot of other fans has been rearranging the tracks from both of these records to form an integrated double album structure, threading the loosely suggestive connections to create a cohesive and flowing singular experience. Excuse me. Uh, my own personal track list in this vein is something that I've become quite satisfied with and I've listened to it multiple times. Uh, I'll throw it up on the screen right now so you can see it. Um, but it has to be said that, um, what, you know, that it shouldn't suggest that these albums in and of themselves aren't satisfying or don't have a structure from start to finish and a reason why they're, you know, sequenced in the way that they are. I, I can't obviously say that the duo intended for the albums to be interrogated in this, like, compilation mix and match way. Um, but their playful self-referentiality, um, the meta gesturing of some of their other recent projects like NTS, and also their online profile, suggests to me an encouraged relationship with fans that makes this kind of experiment seem natural and organic. But what about the album itself? Uh, well, as for Plus, I, as I mentioned, there is definitely a stylistic counterpoint here uh, compared to Sign. Uh, Many of the pieces are much more oppressive in tone and structure than they were on sign. Uh, They employ textures that have a thickness to them that just kind of invades your speakers or your headphones. Um, They kind of, it grips a tight fist around the folds of your brain and it squeezes. And I think, when I think of that, I think in particular of the wheezing progression of a track like 7FMIC, um, which is maybe the most guttural an ugly piece on this record. The first time you hear it, it almost seems like a random series of colliding textures, some whooshing and some metallic and some percussive. Um, It's also notably considerably less overtly melodic than the pieces on sign. And that's not to say there isn't melody here. There very much is, but it is buried between the, beneath the fast paced and constantly shifting and non repetitive textures. In some senses, it might seem amusical uh, at first glance. Um, But once again, as with a lot of Ortecker's later period stuff, close interrogation reveals a carefully refined and very much logical construction to each of these individual pieces. And with regard to 7FMIC, um, for one, the rhythm and the time itself is regular and consistent. It's just that the tonal qualities of the sounds that make up those rhythms are always shifting each time the rhythm is repeated. So normally you would just hear the same sounds in each iteration of a rhythm, but here the textures that make up a rhythm, it's like you're hearing a different snippet of a progression each time that texture uh, is played and it's, they're not, they're like out of order. So it creates this disorienting feel despite the fact that it's still like a tangible rhythm you can grab onto. Um, the whooshing sounds that are cut up throughout this track are not necessarily heard in order. Um, but the piece does have resonant melodic lines at its core that kind of weave in and out beneath all this chaos. Um, the heavy squelches of the sounds that develop in the back half of the track, in particular, I think, recall the, the track AU14 from Sign, which you might recall was the only real heavier track on that record, and provides a kind of clear, subtle but clear link um, to between the two records that I think reinforces their mirroring relationship. 
Um, this is maybe the track, one of the tracks in the record that takes the longest to really kind of wrap your head around, but I think it's one of the most rewarding and impressive. Um, God, that's, you're going to hear that a few more times. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the curious third track, Marhide, almost does the exact opposite in its construction because it utilizes a lot of silence, space, and white noise as integral parts of the rhythmic construction, whereas the previous track were just like a constant barrage of different sounds. Um, Marhide starts with what sounds like a keyboard preset sample. Um, my dad has a few old keyboards that can make sounds very similar to these sounds that you hear on this track, but the bass tone that's kind of like at the surface of these sounds is is much heavier than you would get on a keyboard preset. So it's clearly, um, you know, synthetically created with their with their um, software that they use. Um, uh, it's a disarming track at first. Uh, the way the white noise sort of gradually feeds into the track and eventually kind of overwhelms that um, kind of plinking sample. Um, which, but then the plinking sample starts pushing against it, kind of uh, pushing for its place. And you have this kind of battle that's going on in this mix, these contrasting minimal textures that are also really loud. Um, it's quite haunting, actually, is the quality that it has. I'm not really sure how to describe the effect of this track other and why it works, but I just feel that it really does. And it's perfectly placed as well as an interlude between two longer and more intricately shifting pieces because it's ostensibly the most simple um, piece in its construction on the record. Um, but anyway, speaking of uh, intricate shifting, um, the mammoth E. Col 4, uh, I think, handily stands as the longest piece on either plus or sign at a whopping almost 15 minutes. So what does it do with that time? Well, either a lot or very little, depending on who you ask. Um, once again, as with 7FM IC, the devil is in the details. And E. Col 4 is a slippery fucker that wrestles for your attention, <laughs> as it also seems to kind of fight comprehension as well. The textures in this track are shining, metallic, slippery. Even the way that the ambient white noise washes click in and out of it sounds like almost liqu liquidy somehow. Um, the beat clanks and pulses, and the way everything shifts around evokes this image in my head of a rotating maze of mirrors where the walls are constantly shifting and you're seeing yourself in three different places at the same time. Your image is colliding as the surfaces bend, retract, advance. It's like being sucked into a black hole in slow motion. Uh, the track is also notably slower in tempo as well. It's like it's encouraging you to, or challenging you to gain yeah. your footing and move around it. Uh, it's tempting to talk about it as a space you can move through rather than as a track. And I realize that might sound a bit pretentious, so I won't go down the rabbit hole there. But, but to me, when I close my eyes and put this track on, that's what I'm doing in my head. I'm moving around the space. I'm picturing the scene quite vividly. Uh, there's such a richness to the way that it all shifts too, that the time on this track just flies by for me. Uh, you start noticing, as you always do with longer or thicker pieces, very subtle additions, subtractions, and changes to elements that are more in the background of the track. The beat itself becomes a little more sparse and haunted around five minutes in, as these squalling, hollow tones start kind of cursing it. It's like the lights have gone low, and you're suddenly maneuvering in darkness, and you can hear distant ghostly wails that you can't place or identify. These new textures enter that sound like distorted metallic water droplets, constantly dripping and echoing static. Eventually around seven minutes in, these sounds start rippling and cascading more dramatically till they sound like distant laser beams from a sci-fi movie or like video game noises, or electrical crackling, or even the sizzling of oil on a frying pan. Eventually, hallelujah, you get these melodic bass tones that rise to the top around nine minutes in, 
And then you get the most sudden shift of the track, which is when a steady and throbbing beat emerges. And to be honest, that the boys make you wait nearly 10 minutes for it is a hell of a prick tease. But I think it's also quite clever because it encourages you to further examine those 10 minutes and what's actually going on inside them. Uh, and the way, and more pertinently, the way that they actually build to this sudden shift by starting quite chaotic in the early minutes and just pe slowly peering that back in terms of the percussive element of the song until eventually this new percussive thing comes in really obviously 10 minutes in and it's like, wow, it hits you really hard. Um, the final... The final five minutes of Equal Four feel easier to grasp thanks to the backing of this beat, but the textural sound play is only getting more adventurous with the shining mirror textures I talked about sounding louder, more defined, sharper. It's like uh, at one point it kind of sounds like sheets of jagged metal are raining down on you and you have to dodge them while you're still trying to get to the center of this maze. Um, the bass gets more insistent, rattling, and it's like the earth beneath your feet is shaking too. Um, but what keeps this track from falling into disarray at any point is how steady and consistent in pace that rhythm becomes. Even as it gets deconstructed itself and these shining sounds start fighting to take over the mix. What a fucking journey of a track. Like, I, I, every time I listen to this, I'm like, discovering a new slight change that they that they incorporate at some point that makes it a little bit more unpredictable um finally as the walls close in in the last seconds of the track you make it to the center of the maze and the track ends with just its core a rattling percussive kick before fading out abruptly then you get the, the transition between this track and the next track lux 106 mod is like the ground beneath you has finally just dissipated and you're falling slowly through a low gravity space kaleidoscope. The percussion's gone, as it did for much of sign, and in the reprieve, you're greeted to sounds that feel incredibly colorful, vibrant, even playful, as the best moments on sign did. And the contrast between this, uh, this track, Lux 106 Mod, and the two kind of mammoth epics either side of it, is like getting the best of both worlds with regard to sign and the sonic template the duo have established for this new era of their sound. And it's in this way that Plus continues to give. And boy, does it give. Second major centerpiece and focal point of the record, X4, is one of the most immediately rewarding and fucking fun pieces that Rob and Sean have released in years. Uh, it's an absolute stone cold classic or ticker track and an easy career highlight. Uh, it immediately begins with this propulsive kick beat, these gripping melodic tones, and these absolutely serrating noise bursts that slice through the track like a robot arm gripping a hundred surgeon scalpels and going berserk. Texturally, this combination of sounds actually reminds me of Surrepair, the memorable centerpiece from their underrated album Draft 730, except the tempo on this track is twice as fast and more easily danceable within all takers' standards of dance music anyway. Around four minutes in, some of the backing textures and the scraping sounds actually fall away and the track gets heavier, darker, moodier, uh, though no less propulsive. The constant forward motion evokes a chase scene through a darkened night. And around five minutes in, quite dramatically, a lot of the heaviness and the sound just falls away. But the floor is still there. The beat's still there. So it's like, but that heavy, oppressive atmosphere quality is kind of dissipated. And it's like looking down and instead of the, in, in this chase scene, it's like looking down and instead of running along a road now, you're just running along stars you're just in space running um the absolutely gorgeous ambient pad progression just canvases the whole mix from there and the the beat feels like it's punching into these pads six minutes into the track you get hints of 808 squelches a distinctly 90s texture that will recur in a more prominent fashion later in the album and we'll get to it when it does 
um, seven minutes into X4, the track's gradual deconstruction becomes more apparent. The beat is still there, but it's becoming more subdued, repressed. It's cutting through occasionally rather than constantly. The rattling core of the track is still there, but itself is becoming fragmented. Uh, and then suddenly, one of the most ingenious and stunning additions to an Orteca track is added. This low, kind of mournful sounding melodic pad comes in and it just completely changes the tone of the whole thing. It's gone from feeling like a throttling, uncertain, evasive track to something reflective, sad, almost resigned, despite the fact that that beat is still kicking away at this point. It's as though it's gradually becoming clear that this chase that we're picturing is doomed for the person being chased, that their capture and their demise is inevitable in one form or another, but they keep running despite that realization because it's all that they know how to do. Eventually, however, about 10 minutes in, the running stops because the beat slows to a crawl and the elect electrical noise passages become more buried, distorted, bleeding. Uh, we're hearing a slow death with only this new sad melody and its resonances remaining. The track becomes an elegy, something ghostly and tragic. The melody develops a tactile quality in the sense that it feels like you can hear each note being hit on some organic piece of equipment like an electric piano, despite the fact that it's entirely synthetic. The emotional arc of X4 alone is staggering. Uh, it doesn't waste a second of its 12 minute runtime in weaving this dramatic tale as powerfully and in as affecting a manner as possible. Uh, it's a high watermark of the duo's discography. And to say that at this point, that they're still releasing some of the best material they've ever done in 30 years is really quite something. Mm. Um, the epilogue slash aftermath of this tragedy in this track is the aching and pained electronic screams of the track too pre-esque which bears a striking similarity to the track gr4 from sign but is more for lack of a better word fucked um in isolation it might just sound like this track is screeching colliding pads but but putting it after the drama of x4 makes it feel like grief in the wake of a loss. The life taken in that piece. I mean, if X4 is this brutal chase that ends with a murder in slow motion, then 2 pre esque is the funeral with devastated mourners rendered inconsolable. I mean, if this sounds like a reach, just go back and listen to the way that these pads on this track screech and wail. It's really, really upsetting. Um, and it's powerful for both how clear and regular its doomy melody is, and just how many discordant textures are brushing against it, violating it, shaking it. We get sh in this track alone, we get shades of the metallic walls of E. Cole 4. We get shades of the oppressive squelches of TFMIC. And we get shades of the colorful void of Lux 106 mod. I've read complaints from some people that Plus feels disjointed, badly structured, weirdly loose. And I mean, I frankly just could not disagree more. I feel as though these people are just maybe not quite connecting with what the record is trying to do on a track by track basis and holistically. And I don't blame them because it is something that requires time and, and patience. Um, it's not, and I will say, it's not as though Plus is the most perfectly arced construction of any Orteca record ever from start to finish. Like, it's not a, it's no Confield necessarily. But it is definitely carefully considered. And most crucially, it works. It feels meaningful. There's an extra sense you get from the way the tracks are put together that is in addition to what you get from them alone. And that's what great album sequencing does. It elevates pieces so that in addition to having a, a meaning or a feeling individually, they get something else that could only be got from the way that they're sequenced in relation to each other. And that's the real triumph of Plus, uh, one of many. 
Um, penultimate track, uh, Isla Zero, follows in a similar stylistic manner to Two Pre-esque, um, being these cascading waves of percussionless tones. However, this track manages to feel less pained, but somehow more dramatic, like the preparation for some gigantic battle, or steeling yourself in the midst of overwhelming emotions to be strong, to stand up and move forward. The, the pulsing hits of sound here feel less haunted, less disorienting. They feel more pointed, more forward-moving, and, and powerfully effective. I think that it's pointed and meaningful that two beatless tracks are put back-to-back -back like this on this album. To me, it, it evokes the story of burning in your grief and pain and then rising like a phoenix from the ashes, reborn, new, stronger. Um, yeah, Closer, TM1 Open, is another curveball, somehow both minimal and oppressive. Um, and the next in a long line of memorable album closers, one of Robin Sean's most effective skills as compositional, you know, artist. So it has a throbbing, regular beat, over top of which the band include more of the dynamic 808 squelches that are featured on parts of X4. But here they're front and center and they dominate the track's first half. I don't know if they are taken from real organic equipment, but they certainly sound like it. So I, if they weren't, I would be doubly impressed. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, what I mean by 808 squelches is a particular sound that calls back to Acid House and Techno, mm. specifically the Acid House and Techno scene of Britain and British Electronica in the early 90s. It is a very particular sound mm. um, and, and piece of kit, specifically the 808 is a piece of kit that was employed by artists such as Orbital and Fatboy Slim on seminal records that were personally a huge part of my childhood because those kinds of sh yeah. that kind of shit was my dad played that kind of shit all the time um and they're a very curious and surprising inclusion to hear on an or taker album in 2020 those kind of squelching textures and you do have to wonder why are they here um or taker never utilized this particular sound in their 90s era or if they approximated it it was very not very often but it's undeniably a fabric of the scene that they were born on, a remnant of raves and clubs and a colorful mm. countercultural era that was in large part a response to the cultural austerity enforced by the Thatcherite 80s. You had this um, delirious... Yeah, wonder, wonder, what, wonder what it's like to live in Britain with Tories imposing austerity. Wonder yeah. what that's like. But like, as, like, part, like coming out of the 80s period, culturally... Um, you had this delirious drug-fueled era of expression that's captured vividly in movies like Trainspotting and Human Traffic. Um, and it seems to me that the inclusion of hints at this sound in the first half of the song, not even just like hints at it, like this sound is like the first four or five minutes of this track. It's just that 808 squelching over that beat. Um, to me, it's got to be uh, Orteker's way of bringing things full circle um, w without, you know, being deliberately aping their own early career. Uh, it's a tribute and a winking acknowledgement that at heart, they are those boys, Rob and Sean, from the graffiti scene. And that's what they've been trying to do for the last 30 years, is pull those sounds, pull that era forward past the waning of its cultural relevance, the end of the 90s, and into new and bracing times. Ortega have never stopped trying to progress, to move, to change, to upend expectations, to confound and reward in equal measure. With time, their material had, did grow more demanding. It became hours and hours of textual exploration in the 2010s. And so with these two new records, Sign and Plus, they have peered back a bit to welcome in new ears, new listeners, to a decade that will no doubt be full of new challenges, new surprises, and new classics from these giants of music. It could not be a better time for a record such as Plus Sign, if you want to call it that. 
reminding us of the possibilities of the forms that we celebrate and their use as escapism, but also encouraging us through the music that pushing forward, persisting and complicating your world deliberately, complicating your legacy, your perception is the truest way to live fully and freely. That's the whole Orteca ethos to me. Um, Robin Sean end this album with yet another disintegration into silence. But unlike the disintegration to silence in, in the track X4, at the end of this album, it feels peaceful. It feels like the gradual relief of anxiety, like represented by the bubbling textures that were cascading across the track. In the final minutes of TM1 Open, we listen to a gentle, bassy melody float through the ether, occasionally punctuated by noises from the world below it, but content to hang in the silences between. In keeping with the theme of Orteker and, the, and of this era in particular to change, to confound expectations and to persist in spite of the world, it's fitting that this album should end with a sound like a heartbeat. And so that really brings it full circle. Um, it's really impressive the way that these guys are entering a new era, forging a new kind of variant of their sound, but also kind of bringing everything from the past back along with it without making it seem like a retreat or without making it seem dated. It's very difficult to do that. And you do have to think about, I mean, I often think about like how Robin, what Robin Sean's process must be in terms of appro uh, approaching the concept of a record and how it should sound after 30 years of making music that's constantly like trying to push forward with every record. What do you do at this point? And together as these two parts of a, of a unified whole, a sign and plus seem to be the best answer to that question, I think. Um, you know, sign welcomes new listeners, and then plus, once you've got them hooked, kind of challenges them a little bit further while still kind of keeping um, the same elements that they enjoyed about sign. Or if you weren't as hot on sign, and you wanted something a little bit more challenging, then M plus gives that to you. Like these two things are like a yin and yang situation where they are definitely work as sort of uh, individual cohesive statements you can listen to in isolation, but they become so much more together. Um, and honestly, I feel like a fool for doubting that, that Rob and Sean would be able to do that. Um, but they really have. And it's remarkable. And every single time I listen to it, I appreciate the craft of that, the care and the, you know, inspiration and the, just how difficult it must be to do that. Um, and I worried a bit with sign because I love sign, but I worried a bit like, what is this new direction going to be like? And, and it just, that record makes so much more sense to, and I love sign. I love it, but like it makes even more sense to me now that I have this as well. I get mm. it. Um, and I'm just so fucking, I'm fucking fanboying all over the fucking show and it's so predictable. I know it's so predictable, but, but I don't care because it fucking, it gonks, it fucking, it fucking bumps. <clears throat> And, and yeah, I mean, and, maybe they should have made a less than great record. So exactly, fucking <laughs> let's fucking go 2020s or ticker, whatever it's gonna bring. I'm fucking here for it. Is that your review? That well, yeah, I think I've said enough. Well, that was so beautiful to listen to. Mm. What thank you. I'm lucky, uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that like. I've had this record for like a month now, so I've had the time. Mm. We don't always have like that amount of time with new releases, so. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. Um, but um, I don't want to go next, but I just want to say I support, I just, like you said at the end there, I love the fact that Ortec have been going for so long and they've done all these sort of for the fans projects of really big things that only really devout fans are going to really take the time to check out. Um, and they just dropped in 2020 two hour-long albums 
to show they've still got that immediacy. Yeah. I suppose. Well, it also shows that how that they're not out of touch either, because a lot of people in reviewing records like Elsick and the interview sessions and a lot of the sort of music journalism discourse around that was that Orteca had kind of, you know, swallowed their own tail, gotten lost in themselves, mm -hmm. sure. you know, and sort of stopped thinking about like actually how their music would be consumed. And this kind of proves that that's not true, that it reinforces those you know, our multi-hour records as their own unique statements, not as some kind of indication about, you know, where or ticker are necessarily in t in intending to permanently go. It's like, this is your confirmation that actually, no, they care a great deal about how they're perceived and about how their music can be consumed without wanting to compromise, you know, their artistic integrity. And that's what you get. I'm actually going to touch on that quite heavily in, in my review of it, but I want someone else to go first. Uh, well, I guess well, I'll, 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 I'll I, I was going to say, can I pick <laughs> who goes next? Yeah, yeah go on. Knock yourself out. I, I was going to say, I know Jake's got a lot to say, but I want to hear from Morgan next, if that's all right. Yeah, I can, I can do that. Um, no, no point burying the lead here. Um, now that uh, sign and plus are out as a sort of cohesive unit, um, this is my favorite Autechre project oh, shit. that I've heard. Fuck, oh my just fucking, fucking god. god! Let's do it. <laughs> um, Let's do it. Oh. I think individually uh, they are weaker without the other, um, mm. and together. Just gray, like gray matter expanding. Um, mm. uh, the comparison to Opeth's Deliverance and Damnation is uh, uh, obvious, perhaps to us who have been talking about Opeth for roughly uh, six months now. Um, yeah. No, it's, 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 it's apt. It's good. It's a good it, one. It, it makes sense it feels like much like both of those records it explores the the sides the multifaceted sides of this group in exquisite detail perhaps pushing either any either or any sound that they wanted to in as far as their direction that they could possibly take it um, where Deliverance is this just unbelievably gnarly progressive death metal album uh, plus is this loud weird challenging fight of a listen and where Damnation is a, a sorrowful and but gorgeous sort of exploration of the 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 beauty that these people are create uh capable of creating um sign is the sort of blissful atmospheric uh side that they hadn't explored in quite as much detail as they had bef up to this point and again both like like both of those records one doesn't necessarily feel complete without the other. Um, I didn't really know that they were planning a second album. Uh, you know, I well, at least I didn't know that there were rumors of it, really, not in any way that I had picked up on. Uh, but when they, they, uh, when they announced Plus, I was like, it, was, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I think I, I deliberately avoided mentioning the rumors when we reviewed Sign because I didn't want it to hang over the album when we were talking about it. But now it's kind of like we can discuss the two in relation to each other anyway. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, as we expounded on in great detail when it came out, um, if you watch that episode, you'll know I adored Sign. Um, still do. But now that it's retroactively made more cohesive, 
by plus. I think it's just the power of these two things together. Mm. And like, they're both so dense individually. Like, I'm so glad that they decided to um, release them separately. Yeah, I agree. Um, Just because I wanted to spend as much time with each part of it as possible. Um, It kind of reminds me of the reasoning behind see i'm gonna i'm gonna pull a sertia here and bring up one of my favorite bands somehow um Dude, we already we already did op so we're, we're in yeah. there now. yeah but it also reminds me of uh when between the buried and me released <gasps> yep. automata parts one and two i'm so proud time. of you morgan i'm so proud of you mm. Mm. um mm. but there it's even more glaring how this is really just one record that they kind of chopped in twain to get people to listen to more intently because uh, either side of that record is a lot more accessible than, I mean, for one, it's the most accessible that that band in particular has ever been. But for another, it's also just all very digestible and it, only works 100% when you put the the two of them together. Um, This is like that, but if the decision to split them into two made like heaps more sense, um, it's, I feel exactly the same way as Tyler when he said that um, it's less um, companion pieces and more two sides of the same coin yeah um i i agree with that wholeheartedly um but plus in particular is i think what i enjoy so much about it is just how much of it feels like it's like actively goading you into trying to unpack it um marhide comes to mind immediately with, with the way the sort of the, the, the white noise builds and builds and, and then goes down again and then, and then it builds and it, and it builds and it's, and it's almost overwhelming and then it goes down again. And it's just I like, oof. it's like, it's like the greatest edging of all time. <laughs> I, and so I just, uh, and that's not even top three on the album for me. Um, X4. What? What? I mean, what? How did... What? How did you... How did you do that and get away with it? But, like, even more than that, E. Cole 4 is, like... It should, it, it should be a felony that you made this <laughs> listenable. <laughs> oh... It's like, true though. It's 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 a fifteen minute, like something. I still don't know what it is really, mm. but it's it's fifteen minutes, and it's enchanting because you're just sitting there the entire time, like, what the hell are they doing? And more, in a more pressing way, it's like, why does it work? There is nothing about this that should work for me specifically and yeah. yet it does again the thing is like the thing that make that i think is the that makes it work is the fact that there's always a really strong focus on rhythm like even if the sounds they're using are fucked up there there's yeah. a rhythmic tangibility that grounds you in what they're doing so yeah they can throw whatever they want on it as long as the, but they know how to how to how do they understand rhythm and that's what makes eco four work is that and seven fm and all the other tracks is, is that there's an understanding of, of how rhythm works yeah that's something I, I, I hate to interrupt Tyler's interruption but um <laughs> that's something that really appeals to me about this album in general is that whatever else the band are doing it's grounded in a pretty consistent and engaging percussion and bass rhythm section 
within the mix um, that they could be doing whatever the fuck and they generally do on this record, but that really keeps you there. Yeah, it's like I, if you look at my top three, um, you know, beforehand, uh, they were Confield, Tri Repete, and Untilted. That makes sense. All, all Autaker records with really, really strong sort of rhythmic backbones. Totally. And that tends to be the side of Autaker that I prefer is when the the dance music is more danceable. Um, yeah. And I just, this is very much that, but taken to just uh, bizarre and almost unexplainable extremes. Like mm-hmm. it's so clearly the what every artist who has been working in a certain field should be operating at 30 years into their career like it's something that could only be made by people who have been doing this for at this quality for this long Mm -hmm. and it just it just it just it just it just knocks it just knocks man and sort of once again going back to the opeth comparison i feel like um the 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 tracks more reminiscent of sign feel like uh like remind me of like a fair judgment on deliverance which is the sort of melding of both damnation and deliverance at the same time and that is maybe maybe no it's not um it's maybe top 5 opeth tracks for me and it like it just it, anything that gives me that high is yeah. is just put it put it in my bloodstream, man. I want like the, these two things explored in exquisite detail. Yes, give yeah. me both of them. If you Doing wanna, both like, at the same time. Yeah. If you want to force an OPF compare it like an OPF thing, then you could say like rather than these two albums mirroring Deliverance and Damnation, it's like this album mirrors the structure of an opeth track like just these yeah like you go from these different sections that showcase different um like like for example going from lux 106 mod into x4 two totally different tracks but it just feels like it makes sense when you're listening to it it's the same with the experience of a prog metal song yeah that's that's like the uh, some face of melinda shit Oh yeah, I I thought of like the going from the uh, the Stephen Wilson uh, section of Bleak right into that sort of prolonged uh, guitar acoustic guitar melody, and then the solo over that, but like in reverse. And I just I that's 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 the that's the G spot. You found it. You pressed it. Yes. Cheers. So I tickled Morgan's bee hole. <laughs> it's really, largely speaking, that's what I'm getting at here, is that perhaps more than any other Autechre project, this presses the buttons in my brain that I like this kind of music to press. Um, again, the only vaguely negative thing that I have to say is the only vaguely negative thing that I have to say about sign retroactively is that it's just kind of lesser without its other half. Mm. Yeah. Like um, I'll put, like I said, I I will have put the, if you want to experiment with combining the two records, I'll put my suggested track listing up, but like even just listening to one record after the other is still quite valid, quite like gratifying as well. Um, also, I just want to say I have a very strong feeling based on everything you've just said that you will fuck heavy with XI. I have no doubt. Mm. I just uh, have to get to it. Yeah. But anyway, this, this that album was, does share great XI energy. That was incredibly validating, Morgan, hearing you say everything that you Fantastic just said. Fantastic review. I loved it so much. Good stuff. All right. I know Jake's got a lot to say. I'm going to save him for last, if that's okay with Jake. That's what I figured you were going to do. Okay, cool. Oh, I, just, I don't want to be, you know, if you itching. Anyway, Sersha. Hello. What are you, I'd okay. love to hear what you think. Right. 
so I have notes. I'm going to read, but I want to talk broadly about the two albums first. Um, so last time we talked about Ortec and when we talked about Sign, um, we mentioned this quote from an interview with the uh, two members where they talked about the fact that a lot of people have said, um, talked about the humanity of their records. Um, and they said that they always try to imbue their records with a lot of humanity. And I do see that a lot in everything they make. Um, and of course, sign in the context of that read like reads like an active attempt to make a very, excuse me, human sounding record. Um, and I think a lot about the Coen brothers in this way. And I realized here we go. This, this is, is definitely a social review. I realize this is the second review in a row where I brought out a random movie reference. But here no, look, we are. look, look, I want to, I just, I'm here for it. I don't care right now. Let's just see where it goes. Mm -hmm. look, look, and it goes look, at, and it goes. look at the career of the Coen brothers. They make Blood Simple and then they make uh, Raising Arizona. Or they make uh, Fargo and then they make The Big Lebowski. They make No Country for Old Men and then they make Burn After Reading. Um, or even recently, they make Inside Llewellyn Davis, and then they make Hail Caesar. Um, there is a strain in their back catalogue where they make the most prestigious work, and then they just let loose. Um, yeah. And upon, I see that now. And and upon first glance, it looks like this is the reverse, um, where plus looks like the record where they just wanted the vibe and this is the typical Orteca tightly constructed complicated interesting work but I think this is the the Khan Brothers formula where they almost like went out of their way with Sign to make a record that sounded the way that record did um, and this record feels a lot like they have thrown every idea they have onto a record um, and that is in a way the charm of it. Um, this is the the burn after reading of theirs, in that um, they just made sign, which um, is a moody, very celebrated, very accessible piece in their No Country for Old Men. And then this is your burn off readings or your Big Lebowski's, where it's just let's put we have so many ideas that we couldn't use in our prestigious piece because we were trying to do a thing now we're going to put it all into this um and i think that's broadly the appeal of the record actually um it's that it's just so much and it's you never expect what's coming next sure. um sure sure i hope i made myself clear i don't think i did <laughs> but um sure. No, you did. I would just disagree in the sense that they're not using, you know, leftover ideas in either example. It's more sure. just like this is the sort of, you know, it's it's the way that one sort of gets can get sidetracked when they're creating something. Like in the sense that Barton Fink came out of writing sessions of Miller's Crossing. Miller's Crossing, yeah, yeah. It was, it's just this is this is just sort of the byproduct of working with one idea is that you have about a thousand other ideas that you spring off of from that. Mm, sure. Yeah. I, I have no doubt yeah. from what I gather about the process of like their process of making music that a lot of all that we hear on these two records kind of evolved at the same time and, and yeah. really, and just was shaped into two albums afterwards. Not mm. like that. They, I don't believe I could be wrong. This is pure speculation, but I don't believe they approached the recording process with this idea. It was probably just something that um, felt like the right thing to do in light of the material that they managed sure. to. And I think yeah. both of your comments are the best way to clarify what I wanted to say um, with all three of us taken together to be broadly what I was getting at, um, I suppose. Um, and as a writer myself, what Morgan said of um, you spend a long time making a thing you have a hundred different ideas that don't fit into that thing. Um, I relate to that hugely. And I, and I think that's maybe why I tapped into this mm -hmm. aspect of this album. Mm -hmm. um, 
it opens with a burst um, of, of, of explosive noise for the song, this being Deck Dre Scrap B, Scat B, settles into itself well, in a way. Well done on getting that title right, because I know I've written down Scrap about 10 times. Mm, well, just you say Scap and your mouth wants to say Scrap, but that's the problem. Um, and the burst of noise at the beginning, it sounds like an alien creature emerging from a primordial soup. Oh, yeah, um, that's good. Thank you. Um, yeah, and then so you get these more direct and clinical scents jabbing in more and more as the song goes on. Um, and it begins to sound like a conversation with aliens, um, like a unholy marriage between the music scene in Close Encounters and Arrival. Um, <laughs> you know, but, I, or maybe I, I, I more normally... likely Alien or The Thing. I normally like I normally kind of cringe a bit at like alien comparisons or like alien evocation when talking about Ortega, but like I'm thinking about it now as you say that, and that really is how this track sounds. Like so that's yeah, yeah I like that. Well, it's just um, I haven't. This is actually the first time I have thought of alienness talking about or thinking about Ortega is this track. So um, there's that, but um, it. Just the music of it, when you find the melody, it does sound texturally and melodically like the music seen in Close Encounters. Yeah, um, yeah sure, anyway. definitely. Um, yeah, but this uh, track can be super unfriendly and abrasive, but there is melody and emotion there if you want to look for it and if you bother to look for it. Um, and this, in a way sets the tone for the album. Um, it, in the, um, there is so much here if you have the patience to dig for it. Um, like, I played Orseca both, I want to say, uh, Sign and Try Repetai to um, my parents, Try Repetai to my mother, Sign to my no, try repetai to my father, son to my mother. They both thought it was unlistenable. Um, but I. <laughs> Plebs. Um, but I listened to it um, and I can't help but hear beauty on both albums. Um, and this is the thing about Ortega is if you are on. Just that their my way parents down, are stupid. <laughs> if. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. Um, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, the point is, if you are on their wavelength, there's a lot to discover. But if you're not, you're just not, and you can't blame anyone for it or do anything about it. It's just where they're at. Um, so in a way, this is the most Orteca album they've made for a while. Um, because this album is so much like that. Um, the second track, 7FMIC, um, the, the noises come and go frequently in it, um, but there's a stable beat um, of crunchy hi-hats that almost sound... Um, I don't imagine they were played acoustically, but they sound... Like they were played with with um, brushes and not sticks, um, and then clipped, um, and and these boops come in and they join a melody, um, and they build this rhythm with an increasingly chaotic, almost revolving door of unfriendly but short-lived explosions of noise that jab at you. Um, the joy in this track is the contrast Orteca play with in density of noise. Sometimes um, they'll have the um, noises that would otherwise be at the most forefront of the track, but cut out the normal background chatter of, of noise, of chaotic um, individual notes to give you this jabbing sensation. Um, sometimes they will give you almost nothing and they will sometimes overwhelm you with sounds. And it is the interplay between these textures that I find the attraction of the second track on this record. Um, Marhide has this eerie noise coming in 
over um, a rather unassuming beat. Um, and the impression this gives is that you interact with this, um, I felt almost like Porter's head type drum beat, um, with these incredibly noisy sounds coming in over it, to the point where it, it feels like, I, I want to say a mugging, like this sound just going about their business, and this person or thing just attacks them. Um, yep, that, 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 that could definitely apply to a lot of pieces by Orsica. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But the person isn't me, it's the, the percussive beat. Yeah. Um, in the scenario. Um, I didn't know the song was featuring you. Sorry. It's <laughs> in the listener. Sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Sorry. I didn't know <laughs> you were on this track. My height. Feature in the agenda. <laughs> or, or take a, do you want me to feature? I'm here. Anyway, um... But anyway, um, the noise... We'll take her uh, remix skin type bodysuit challenge. Please! Um, e. Cole 4 is a lengthy highlight for me on this record. Um, it opens with chaotic and, and, and shining, tinkling noises over the shifting, almost like Trent Reznor soundtracking a David Fincher film um, underline. Um, actually, the general tone of this song made me feel like I was in David Fincher's remake of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And I was Lisbeth Salander hunting down monsters um, in, in the shadowy back alleys, you know. Yeah. X4 starts off feeling like a normal dance song if it had schizophrenia. Um, with, with these buzzing chainsaw synths going on in your ear. Um, and it, it occasionally um, the beat will syncopate for about two beats and then resume. Um, and it just, it creates this feeling like this is a normal dance song. If, if, if like I was about to become possessed by the devil. Um, and it's very, very effective. Um, it, um, yeah, uh, there is again here a somewhat, not exceptionally, but somewhat conventional beat that grounds it. Um, but this song is probably the most pointed example of my only really real critique with the record, mm -hmm. which is that there are so many ideas here. Um, do I feel like they always come together? in something I can just listen and appreciate on an immediate level. No, it, but that doesn't mean I don't respect the attempt. No, it's and fine. when I listen to the song, it doesn't mean I don't listen to the song and I'm not intellectually stimulated. Mm -hmm. I just maybe don't love listening to it all the time. Track seven is um, too pre-esque or I.I. pre-esque. Um, which I Im immediately made me think of the track on, on sign of um, desk esque or de escalating escalating or whatever. Yeah, the one. Esk desk, sorry, that's that's it. Yeah. Um, and whilst I don't, s I see a broadly structural comparison to that song, which is itself referenced in the title of esque desk. Um, the only, th the main thing really is that this, the, the sound of the lead synth on the song is almost fucking identical to that song on sign. Yeah. Um, Definite callback. Um, so with a closer track, TM1 open, it builds off of this driving dance beat with skating arpeggiated melodies to build this um, medium spacious vibe uh, and it brings in lots of different sounds that contrast with each other in interesting ways. But L0 is also great. Um... And then that's the end of the record. Um, TM1 Open has this interesting moment where it sort of begins to peter out and it feels like the song's ending and then it comes back into itself. Um, mm -hmm. And I, that's really interesting. I love it when songs do that. Um, it's a great example. Overall, do I feel like this is maybe or take most cohesive record? No. Does it need to be? Not necessarily. Did I vibe to it to an extraordinary extent? Yes, I did. Um, 
do I still have all Tekarekas like sign like Oseps like Triarepti uh, that I prefer? Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you for being honest about the record. I appreciate that. I always enjoy opinions. Especially after you me and Tyler just, just verbally vomited yeah. praise really onto the both record, of you. You know, I, I love this record a lot. Um, I All just, right, Jake. Yeah. Let's, I'd love to hear um, the long awaited return of Jake from yeah, here. His, his slumber. Let's do this. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to try and put together a cohesive piece on this just because I think the last two segments about Altecker that I did were fucking terrible and I hate myself. So, oh, poo. Right. Right well, I, I was just like, all right, now I have the chance to finally prove myself. And then it's just like, and the record I get to do it with is the most inaccessible Altecker record I've <laughs> listened to. Great. Good. I'm glad. Good for me. Good, good, good. But uh, Y'all know I like Sign a lot. Uh, mm. Since I've uh, sort of listened to some other Autica records, I'm a bit more storied now. I've listened to things like Tri I've listened to most of their records. I still need to get to stuff like Chiastic Slide, which I have been assured that I will fuck with and I am excited to get to. But have this was sort of. To, have you listened to Exile, Pichon? Yeah, I have. I like it. Um, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, it's very good. Um, I was just sort of like, okay, but instead of going to those ones, I want to focus on Sign and Plus, just because they are immediately here, we're going to be talking about them, and I didn't want to put Sign down just because I was talking about Plus, because I know it's a companion piece, so this is what I have to say about it. I will do my best to go through it quickly, because I have written extensively just to <clears throat> do that. All right. I am in a precarious position with Plus right out of the gate. I've only become familiar with Altecker in the last few months, but after going through more than half of their discography and becoming a fan, I at least consider myself to be partially capable of evaluating this somewhat. Uh, I heavily enjoyed Sign and was just generally a fan of the new Sonic approach they seem to be taking. While not absolutely head over heels, it seemed to be gesturing at a warmer, enveloping, patently emotional direction. Uh, it wasn't exactly the same. But to me, it bore the closest resemblance to my favorite Altaica record thus far, Oversteps, which leaned into a, uh, uh, heavily into a more dreamier, ambient, vast soundscape. Uh, while I was prepped for Plus by more storied fans of the group, by them telling me it was different and far more unwieldy, uh, I was still hoping that enough of the sound or direction was retained to capture my interest in this new avenue. Uh, and in that respect, that could have been partially unfair of me, uh, but I still went in with an open mind, trying to anticipate maybe something more along the lines of Draft 7.30, uh, and while not entirely dissimilar, um, I think what I got instead was something a bit more challenging and comparatively much more minimal. Um, the unruly beginning of Deck Dre Scrap B... Close enough. <laughs> sure. Um, is a great introduction. Uh, it squawks and stutters into the immediate chaos and blaring noise is chopped up and scrapes against the more direct industrial and metallic hits in the song. Um, it sounds like a track from Sign if you put it into a musical trash compactor, uh, and it's oddly compelling. Um, its progression into being noisier and generally more overwhelming, slowly building momentum, is a far cry from the overwhelming warmth of Sign, but it's an uneasy, anxiety-riddled assembly of noise that feels like it's not trying to have the opposite sound of Sign, but instead trying to imbue the listener with the opposite feeling as that record, where Sign is welcoming, plus is riddled with nervous tension. Um, the opener is one of Altecker's shorter tracks, uh, but works as a general tone setter, and we move right along into 7FMIC, which has this thudding and bass-driven pulse to it over the sound of what seems like someone rapidly speeding up and slowing down some futuristic robotic assembly line at random intervals, uh, giving it a jittery start-stop feeling that gradually starts to slow down the more and more it progresses. Uh, another contradictory element to Sign's occasional forms of melody and flow, this feels like its sole intent is to disrupt, to counteract. I think this is the closest the record actually comes to sounding like its sister album, but its whooshing and rapid ascending and descending synths carry an air of vague menace, uh, reminding me occasionally of Confield, 
Uh, it combines the vastness of Oversteps and Sign with the otherworldly intensity of the group's more sonically dark moments. Uh, while initially compelling and still retaining being a quality track, I find the length here to be slightly against its favor. Uh, it's a six minute track with three minutes worth of really, really good ideas. And the track structure and progression doesn't yield enough for me to really desire to return to it outside of the context of listening to the whole record to evaluate it holistically. Uh, I enjoy the final 20 seconds a lot where it feels like the track itself is unspooling and coming apart. Uh, but the scattered and unfocused approach to sound play here feels like an idea that is spread a little bit too thin. Um, put a pin in that. We pick back up uh, with uh, the shorter and more curious Marhide. Um, it's a lot less overwhelming than the previous track, but the slowly building nervous tension of the static that slowly threatens to overtake the simple driving beat feels like an inspired idea for a track, especially on a record like this. It feels like it is trying to escape an unseen evil. And even though it begins as this incredibly simple and awkward little tune, it grows into something icy and frightening and feels like it's the absolute perfect length to pursue its goals without overstaying its welcome. It feels like a track on a classic PS2 side Silent Hill game if it was done by Autek, or so naturally, I think it's awesome. Uh, we then go into the mammoth 15-minute equal four, uh, which starts out sounding like Oversteps, more robotic cousin, uh, a quiet electronic timbre, and a slowly thudding scrape remind me more of the deliberate ambient electronic efforts from Trent Reznor's Ghost Projects. Uh, there's a real density to the beginning of this, the shuffling and abruptly cut off driving beat, the ethereal and ghostly sweeps of percussion. It creates an uneasy atmosphere, but not one as deliberately overwhelming or frightening as the others that came before it. The tension feels a bit more relaxed at the start, which is a welcome change of pace. Um, as it proceeds, we get more of a minimal percussive emphasis that, for whatever reason, makes me feel like I'm stuck inside a malfunctioning computer from the mid-90s. Towards the center... This is a good analogy. You did a good job there. Uh, thank you. Um, towards the center, these strange, liquidy beats are combined with something fuzzier and more disruptive, but further slow down the already mellow track. Everything kind of fades into the back of the mix, and every hit from the beat sounds like it's coming from behind a half-soundproofed wall, like something is trying to methodically break out of it. In theory, I really like where this goes. But like the earlier track I talked about, I'd be lying if I said the length wasn't an issue for me. It feels like it rides out all of these movements for just a little bit too long. And once, the approach, uh, and once we approach the final segment where it picks up again, it doesn't really become or turn anything satisfying to me. It sort of plods along, the song itself having the structure of kind of a bell curve in a lot of ways, but I feel like it could have been tightened into something denser that accomplishes its goals a bit more succinctly. I'm not inherently opposed to longer tracks either, but I am opposed to when it feels like it doesn't achieve much in the grand scheme of things. A good track that is, again, spread far too thin and isn't dynamic enough to me to warrant taking up so much of the album. It's not unenjoyable, but certainly more patience trying, especially now that I've experienced enough of the Autaker catalog to think that they do this kind of approach on things like Tri Repeti and hell, even Amber much better. We then arrive at Lux 106 Mod, which immediately sounds like you're in some kind of futuristic spaceship right at a Star Trek The Next Generation. I love how glittery and still very lush this track is, especially compared to everything that came before it. It's a very gentle, light reprieve from the anxiety of the last few tracks. It's like a brief little refuge, and feels very exploratory and full of wonder, almost. It does stick out a little bit, all things considered, but it's easily one of the album's finest moments, so it really doesn't bother me too much. With X4, we immediately go back into something much bigger, 12-minute track that begins and immediately makes me think of weird futuristic power tools buzzing and spinning to fix some sort of alien mechanism. These sounds are some of the most textural, immediately impactful ones, not on the album itself, but in the band's discography. 
it's almost like the tools and items making these sounds are digging into my brain directly. A uh, comparison I once made about Confield, which it sounds very similar to, but not in a bad cacophony type of way. It's in a way that scratches that particular itch that only Oateker can. It stutters, spins, and cycles along while a distant ambience sort of flows in the background. It goes from being a fast-paced and kind of intense track to returning to the anxiety felt on the rest of the album. Ah, oh, sorry, my neck hurts like a motherfucker. Part of the track begins to echo when a sharper backing beat comes into play, hitting back at that conflict on the sound, the, the record that I enjoy a lot. Um, it ultimately becomes a more sinister, distant sounding and brittle, clattering beat with momentum where it feels like we're back to the more spacious sound of the last track, but there's no respite here, just more tension. It slowly focuses itself as it comes to a close in what I'd classify as the track's final movement, and sadly encounters the problem I found with the previous long track. While it's a bit more varied and dense than that one, it still feels like it's stretched to the point where it's hard to stay engaged the whole way through. It's so very easy for my attention to wander in this segment. If it had been more condensed, I feel like it would have helped the pacing and overall flow of the track and the record in total. Uh, I'm not, how do I even say <laughs> Pre-Escape immediately begins sounding more like Lux 108 mod. Rushes of electronic hits are caught amidst synths with an underlying bass that feels so weirdly soothing and easy to get lost in. It's a welcome refrain from the previous track, and for more reasons than its similarity to Oversteps. Easily my favorite track on the album, even though I don't think it's one of the more structurally adventurous or even dynamic entries. Its brevity helps it immensely, and its startling beauty is what makes me feel like that this isn't too thin. It sort of lumbers to a close until it becomes almost agonizingly quiet, creating a beautiful tension for the following track. Essel Zero is probably the most emotional song on the record. It begins with a haunting but still strange showcase of synths that blare almost like an organ. I can't explain why, but there's a longing to the beginning of this that feels so tangible. Something about how the more busy parts of the track are just being buried under the core of the song, and it feels helpless, full of despair. It's the kind of song that you'd listen to with the view of an entire city below you. It just imbues me with this sense of yearning and manages to be the only song on the record that I wish was even longer, as I felt it could have been developed into something a bit more evocative and sweeping rather than ending so abruptly, which I don't entirely hate, by the way, as it's a creative decision I can get behind, um, but I do feel that it could have ended the song much better had it been more adventurous. The closing track, another song that extends beyond the 10 minute mark, begins with a more traditional beat and these liquidy metallic hits that leave me near flummoxed at the beginning due to how all over the place they are. And I mean that in a good way. It feels like the music that would be at the beginning of a movie montage, even reminding me heavily of Matt Quayle's expansive work with the score of the TV series Mr. Robot. It's not as tangibly full of fear or conflict like other points on the record, but unlike the last two long tracks, I feel its structure complements it very well. The evolution of the sound here is dynamic, but never so out of left field that it feels like it lacks cohesion. The middle is far more minimal, sometimes to its detriment where it sounds like a more sparse oversteps, especially with those abrupt strumming sounds that punctuate the beat really reminded me of that. However, the slack is picked up with its final third, where it stumbles and contemplatively explores a more minimalist sound that evokes a profound loneliness to much greater effect than other moments on the album, I find. It took a while to grow on me, as it is patience demanding like the other long cuts, but it serves its emotional purpose really rather well, especially when you contradict it against the intent of the other record. Plus is, for me, a very strange beast, because I didn't find it that unfriendly, to be honest. There are other more confrontational records the duo have put out that I got on board with fairly immediately. It definitely works as a companion piece with Sign, and in many ways, I think that's where the genuine success of the record lies. As I said earlier, it opposes Sign not truly in aesthetic or texture, but when it comes to the tone and its desired effect on the user instead. If Sign is being hit by a ray of light reflected, refracted through dozens of glass lenses all pointed at you, then Plus is instead here to deprive you of that light. It's anxious, sparse and occasionally beautiful that feels 
cold and despondent. However, that is also where my problem lies. I think it works really well as a companion to its sister album, but as an experience divorced from that context, I don't really work, think that it works to the degree that it should. Both uh, after listening to this in tandem with Sign and just on its own, Plus feels like a successful exercise in technique, but not necessarily in form. Its minimal despondency and coldness works for its intent, but in terms of being a compelling and immediate listen, I find it woefully inconsistent, perhaps more than I let on, but it mainly comes down to the fact that the three longest tracks here, songs that make up the vast majority of the album, are the ones that I say are handily the weakest. I'm not here to debate whether or not Plus is achieving its specific goals or means that it's a success or not. I'll leave that to people who care more, frankly. Uh, as a singular experience, I enjoy it, but I mostly wish the whole record had the consistency of its shorter, denser cuts. In theory, the album structures itself really, really well, but I don't think this sound is conducive to Autechre's goals, at least not to the degree that it, they were with Sign. Uh, and even still, a lot of my enjoyment here comes from my familiarity with the band's oeuvre, so I can appreciate the experimental ventures a bit more acutely. And while I don't think being good and being accessible are things that have to coexist in an album, I do believe that you have to find a very thin line to stand upon for a balancing act. Plus, to me, as I've grown with it on each listen, definitely succeeds conceptually, but is woefully mixed viscerally in a way that even some of the lesser records in Autechre's catalog are not. I feel bad, as this seems to be a real Autechre fan's Autechre record, so to speak, but I think I would return to nearly every other album of theirs I've heard before this uh, if I were to revisit them. Despite the fact that I think this is solid and contains very, very good highlights, I just don't think enough great material is here for me to label it any more than a good, but nonetheless very mixed bag. Well, I'm going to change my name to Poppy because I disagree. Oh. Uh, but I want to say, Jake, that was a Obviously. very, very good review. And that's it not was. just me saying it because we compliment each yeah, other's reviews. I, I knew I was going to be the devil's advocate here because I just could tell that everybody was going to fuck with it more. And I was just like, put, God, I really wish I could fucking explain here's, this. Here's the thing, Jake. You put loads of effort into explaining your viewpoint well. And that's yeah, you, you, you yeah it's, but it's still just like you know there's always the the ever-present feeling that everybody is h hanging out at the coolest party that you didn't get invited to yeah especially well, with autecker well, well you went to the party and you didn't like it as much as everybody else so you left i mean it's yeah. look jake as well keep in mind the fact that you stand over steps you stand fucking yep. confield you stand yes, fucking try repetai i straight amber i oh. fucking so you've been you've been at the fucking table you've ha you've hang out with the cool i was at the gates motherfucker wow. i was look, at the look, gates came to and, party. and now someone you were on around. one <laughs> yeah, now he's on one look That's look it. you came to the party someone brought around the table of hors d'oeuvres and you sampled loads of them and they were great and there was one that everyone loved it was like curried shrimp or something and this wasn't for you See, but that's the thing, too, is that it's also just like I, again, everything I said notwithstanding, I think it's a good record, and I also didn't want to come across like the fucking wonky angle motherfucker who sounded like he was talking about nonsense. No, you definitely, well, exactly. you definitely the, the, reviewed it much more intelligently than that. Mm, and you one, didn't fucking only, talk for the, the, the record that. deserves a lot more than that than being yeah. talked about like it's a fucking conspiracy you theory psyop like, the, you didn't the talk for three you. minutes about whether the fucking record should be played at the exact same time as sign <laughs> wow We've, we've, we, this is, we've, been, we've all been yeah. on one. Let's do our favorite yep. tracks and ratings. <laughs> yep. Jake, sure. let's do you that. lead us off. Uh, hold on a moment. Let me pull it up. My favorite tracks are um, Lux 106 Mod, 
uh, pre-escape and um, Essel Zero. Uh, least favorite track, probably gonna go with... Now I'm just picking which which is the one that is going to get me yelled at for being a normie for picking it. <laughs> <laughs> this is what. So okay, no, no, the the one I enjoy the least is equal four. Mm-hmm. Cool. And your rating? Uh, six out of ten. Sick. Sick. Okay. Sick. Ain't here. So Morgan. Uh, my three favorite tracks are. Uh, X4, 7 FM, IC, and I'll say Lux 106 mod. Uh, my least favorite is uh, uh, Melv. Um, <laughs> and my my rating is I'm I'm once again going to go for a nine and a half, but also a uh, plus King. sign. Plus sign is a ten. So my favorite like tracks this. are Drek, Dectri, Scab B, E Cold Four, um, and I'm gonna say L Zero. I'm gonna give this record eight out of ten. Sick. All right, my three favorite tracks are well, X Fucking Four, um, Hawk. I can't, I'm sorry, Jake, but like I was when you were talking about that track, I could just w- looked over at Morgan and he and I were making the exact same expression. At you. Which was, <laughs> sir, uh, you need to no, leave what, the restaurant. Wait, what, what for? What track? Like, because because I said it wrong X4. or because I no 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 like no it. no because you had a bad opinion. Oh, I mean, I still think it's a good song. It was, expressed, it was a bad opinion. It was expressed eloquently and understandably. But it was wrong. Uh, <laughs> you're a fucking moron, but at least you're hot. That's that's what that energy was. My favorite tracks are X4, E. Cole 4, and Isla Zero. And Isla Fisher. Yep. And plus gets a 9.5 plus sign. I actually haven't, haven't decided if plus sign as a whole is 9.5 or 10, but it's it's a it's very good album. Mm-hmm. Sign got an 8.4 from us as a collective, and this got an 8.2, so I think they're really, really They great records, aren't they? Yeah, they're yes. both good. Okay. I ain't gonna be mad. Fantastic stuff. So, <laughs> next week on uh, The Pod, we're going to be reviewing uh, Liturgy's new uh Black me- Transcendental Black Metal Opera, uh, <laughs> Origin of the Alimonies. The titty one. The titty one, Origin of the Alimonies, uh, featuring Zach, who's going to be joining us again for that. Can't of wait. Uh, we'll also be reviewing uh, one of the, the, new, the debut record from one of the biggest artists in the world right now, Megan the Stallion's Good News. Can't um, wait for that too. We will also be touching on King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard's new release, KG. Uh, yeah. So yeah, get your bananas ready. Um, the, the, and, the flying microtonal variety. Uh, yes, wow. exactly. One of my favorite new bands. We're going to talk about the new record. Yes, and uh, so yeah, so this week in our record club, which you can jump over to now if you wish, we're going to be talking about fucked up so you dose your dreams, and in next week's record club, we'll be talking about the Mollusks by Ween. So plenty to look forward to. Hit us up in the comments and let us know what you think of the albums we discussed today. What do you think of Aesop Rock Spirit World Field Guide? What do you think of Ortecker's Plus? Um, tell us who's right. Tell us who's wrong. Tell us what you think. Uh, and yeah, let us know exactly how you feel about stuff. Yeah. Rock over London. Rock, uh, on, rock Chicago. on Chicago. Eminem.